posted by user Lurliger, titled, Am I the asshole for suggesting to my wife that we kick out our daughter and son-in-law? So I, 55 male, have a daughter, 27 female, and she has a fiancé, 26 male, and they both live with us. My wife, 54 female, and I, always made it very, very clear to our children growing up that they were always welcome to come home and live with us if anything happened, and my daughter and her fiancé had a really, really hard time finding a place to live after graduating, so we arranged for her to come and stay with us. Her fiancé has absolutely no family, and we absolutely adore him here, so we invited him to live with us too. That was two and a half years ago. They had one interview with an apartment last year that turned them down, but they haven't made much of an effort to move out. In fact, they're kind of freeloading and not moving anywhere in life. Our daughter really wants to do art, so she designs tattoos and sells some of her designs to a local shop, but that doesn't make a whole lot. Then our son-in-law really wants to be a movie editor, and he works part-time for a production company. They both really only make enough to cover their own expenses, health insurance, car payments, cell phone, etc., and they live here rent-free and don't seem to be doing much with their lives. They do some work, but they spend most of their time sleeping, having sex, and going out together to the movie theater. When I tried to bring this to my wife and suggest that we kick them out, or to push them to get actually decent paying jobs, she was appalled and asked what was wrong with me. She told me that she is our child and he is our future son-in-law and is family too, and she said she couldn't even believe that I'd suggest that. I told her I thought I was being perfectly reasonable since they aren't doing shit with themselves right now and I don't want to enable them pissing away their lives. She told me I was acting like an ass, and as far as she's concerned, they're doing just fine because they're doing what they love for work while being surrounded by supportive and loving family members, then added a, well, mostly, at the end. I said I felt that we should end the conversation, and we moved on with what we were doing. Maybe it wasn't nice of me to do that, but seriously, it annoys me to see my daughter wasting away at her potential while my other kids are going on to big things. Hell, her sister, four years younger than her, is in Australia right now. Bit of how you going. Am I the asshole? Edit. I feel like I should clarify something. I think it's safe to say that everyone in the situation knows that they are freeloading, my wife no doubt knows it and is ignoring it, but both of the kids no doubt know it too. They don't let us pay a single cent for any of their expenses beyond the living situation. They even pay for all of their own food, toothpaste, shampoo and soap, and they take care of every single personal expense they have. I've also heard conversations my daughter and my sister-in-law had with my wife, and they absolutely know that they are running in place in life. Also, one last thing I want to clarify is that they both have a theatre subscriptions that's like 20 bucks a month each for unlimited movies at a nearby movie theatre, so it's not like they're irresponsibly spending money willy-nilly on movies all the time. I'm gonna go with no assholes here for this one. I think it's okay for you to suggest these things, in all honesty. Though instead of just discussing it with your wife, I think all four of you should come together and discuss the living arrangements, how you feel about it, and what you feel needs to change in order for you to feel happy with this situation. Although I'm guessing that is the logical next step in all of this, I would judge you if you did something rash without talking to them. In the comments, Snoowords4839 says, Not the asshole. Since wife is against kicking them out, time for the rent and food conversation. They may be pursuing their dreams, but they need to be responsible adults. Something you can do, if you can afford it, any money they pay you, put in an account for them, but don't tell them about it. Gift it when they finally are out and responsible. And OP replies, Oh wow, I like that idea. We're pretty well off, so it's not like we need them to chip in, so that would work. Wooden Discount replies, my friend did this for a homeless person she had in her house temporarily. When the lady got a place, they used said rent money to get her stuff for her apartment. Not the asshole. They are just being enabled at this point. Chasing dreams is great, but only after you can pay all of your own bills or have a set timeline to make real money. They will end up living off of you forever unless they change. Time for rules, rent, and a plan. Not the asshole. I'll bet there are a lot of resources on how to gently push young adults out of the family home to be found online, because tons of posts on this appear each week. You need a timeline, perhaps a year, with quarterly milestones including job research, job applications, housing research, savings, and contributions to the household, chores, errands. 
Your wife is, frankly, delusional if she thinks her 27-year-old daughter is doing enough adulting by occasionally selling some drawings for 50 bucks a pop. I wouldn't advise calling your wife delusional, of course. I would advise booking a session with a family counselor and talking about the situation in that forum. I can pretty much guarantee that the counselor will agree that the 27 and 26 year old couple is taking advantage of your generosity to delay having to become self-sufficient. Of course, the housing market sucks out there, but these two aren't even trying to find work to save money to move out. Try to get on the same page with your wife regarding a plan, then bring in the insufficiently motivated couple to lay it out for them. Counseling might seem extreme, but if you can't get your wife to stop thinking like a mother hen with fluffy yellow baby chicks, the next thing you'll know you'll have a couple of new babies added to your full household. And you'll be hearing how their parents couldn't possibly afford a two-bedroom apartment, pay for childcare, etc, etc. And now onto the update. My wife and I decided to sit them down for a conversation, and we asked them what their short and medium term goals were. Over the course of the conversation, my daughter started crying because apparently she thought she heard me call her a loser recently, which I absolutely didn't mean to. And they told us that they've been drowning in credit card debt, they have five cards and a $4,000 deep across them all, and they have both been going through some horrible depression. He's been on some antidepressants for most of the time that I've known him, and apparently she went back on hers recently, and my wife and I had no idea. They both said they know they're freeloading, and are disappointments and burdens, and are wasting their times, and wasting their prime years. I honestly was not at all expecting that. It actually made me feel horrible that I even entertained the idea of kicking them out, but they told us that they do want to move out and get real jobs, and start a family at some point. I told them both I was terribly sorry if I made them feel like I didn't think much of them or that they were losers because I am very proud of her and love her so much and that I was happy to have him as a son-in-law and have my daughter be with someone who clearly respects and cherishes her. Over the past two weeks they've been submitting applications and today they both got jobs at an AMC theatre nearby. They're both working at the same location and are going to go to work together and they have their first day on Thursday. They said once they get their finances in order, they'll figure out a monthly rent and they'll pay us. My wife and I told them to please keep their money, since it sounds like they need it badly right now, but they insisted. I'll admit I did think they were being lazy and unmotivated at first, but I didn't realize they were in so much pain. I'm super proud of them for taking the next step and moving towards their own independence, and hopefully they'll achieve that dream of moving out and having a family soon. So yeah, that's the update. Edit, they told us that they were trying to downplay it because they were afraid we'd judge them, and collectively between the two of them, the total is closer to $6,000 in credit card debt. However, I still think it's nothing that they can't come back from, and if they both consistently work and are smart with finances, I'm sure they'll be debt-free by the end of the summer. In the comments, American Health 74 says, Not the asshole, and thank you for listening to them. Maybe take their rent and quietly put it in an account that you don't tell them about, but give them half when they get their own place as a safety net, and keep the other half to give them as a safety net that they don't know about in the future. Teddy Asso says, The daughter should learn to tattoo. I know the industry isn't without its issues, but it can pay quite well for someone who is a talented artist. Right? She can't be making much of anything selling designs. I don't get why she wouldn't just learn the art. I also don't get why a shop would buy someone's designs and not take them on as an apprentice. I assume that he means they're buying her flash sheets, and I've never been in a shop that had flash sheets from either employees or well-known tattoo artists on the walls. A lot of what's being said doesn't make a ton of sense, especially when the resolution is jobs at the movie theater. It could be that she has some trait that makes her totally unsuitable as a tattoo artist, like a needle phobia. I have shaky hands. I can draw slash make digital art, since I can erase the scratchier, sketchier, and shaky lines. Can't do that with tattooing. Based on that bad tattoo subreddit, it doesn't seem to stop some though. Quicksilver1964 says, and, once again, proper communication saves the day. But seriously people, talk to one another, especially if you live in the same house. FL says, they're freeloading but still digging themselves into debt? Yes, they are depressed. After this conversation, they also started sending out applications and got jobs lined up. It can be chicken and egg. Are they stuck because they're depressed, or are they depressed because they're stuck? 
Either way, the trick and trap of depression is making efforts to change the circumstances so they don't seem impossible and hopeless. Acknowledging that depression effing sucks and makes everything suck doesn't mean enabling depressive passivity. Capitalist dystopian hellscape brainwashing or not, most people actually don't feel very good being dependent and in a rut. Choosing a life of leisure is great, having no choice can also be painful. Good for everyone for talking, for the younger generation for making a change, and for OP for having some empathy. It sucks how it ends up being a self-fulfilling prophecy of sorts. You're depressed, so you don't do anything, which makes your life worse, which makes you more depressed, repeat ad nauseum. The passivity really makes things worse, and it's hard as hell to help someone stop it while showing compassion. For me personally, I very much agree with that sentiment. Do not enable depressive passivity. We've all been there, you know, I, I know how that feels, and I can empathize absolutely with OP's child. And yes, again, it's great to see communication. Communication seems to be solving all, for better or for worse. So that's my take. What do you think of this one? I'd love you to let me know down below. Unexposed is by user Ghost201121, titled, Am I the asshole for screwing in my fence panels so they can't be lifted? I have lived in my house for almost three years. I live in a corner house next to the road, a road back road. A lot of the kids in the neighborhood play ball games in that area. This doesn't bother me much apart from when they kick it against my fence. One thing that does bug me is how often they would come to the door because the ball had gone over into the garden. I know this seems like such a small thing, but I'm talking five to six times a day. I used to work from home, so I would just get the ball and ask them to be more careful. However, I recently changed jobs and now work out of the house. My partner is still home throughout the day but is hard of hearing and never hears the kids when they knock. She actually uses more sign language than anything or reads lips as she can't hear well at all without her hearing aid, which she only really wears when she's leaving the house. Anyway, since I haven't been home to answer the door, I found out the kids have actually been lifting my fence panel and coming into my garden to get their balls. I hate this. It makes me feel like my space and my privacy is violated. I also have four dogs who are usually outside when the weather is nice. I have cameras, so have caught them doing this and have evidence, but their parents don't seem to care. So I decided to screw all my fence panels in so they could no longer be lifted. Now every night I go home, I'm greeted with a bunch of angry kids telling me that their ball is in my garden and they can't get it. I just ignore them and throw the ball over without speaking to them. Yesterday when I got home, one of the kids' mothers was at my front door. When I got out of my car, she instantly started yelling and calling me a thief for not getting her son's ball. I told her that I was at work and she started yelling about how my partner could have sorted it out. I told her I'd go get the ball so calm down and she said that I needed to fix my fence as it was broken and the kids couldn't go get them on their own anymore. I told her it wasn't broken and I had done that so they couldn't get in. This made her very angry and she started yelling. I told her I couldn't have them letting my dogs out and also mentioned how they almost broke my fence once and she threatened to call the police for theft the next time I don't get the ball immediately. So am I the asshole for stopping them from getting into my garden? And could they actually call the police when I'm not even home to get the ball? Man, I'm trying not to insert myself personally into OP's shoes in these situations, but my immediate reaction when the mum came <laughs> at OP here was to be just like, Oi, piss off, get out of my face. I don't want this, you don't want this. Ah, yes, me getting out of my car, instantly yelling and calling me a thief. Normal? A uh, socially acceptable reaction to a situation like this. Not unhinged mother, not unhinged at the slightest. Uh, not the asshole for this one, OP. What is her problem? Now in the comments, JSC TMAV says, Not the asshole. You should just laugh at the mum and tell her to go ahead and call the police. You will be very happy to have them stop by to explain the situation. If they come out and find that you are being accused of stealing when kids are throwing or kicking balls into your yard when you're not home and having to do without them for a few hours, they are going to be very upset with her for wasting their time. Offer to call them for her, then show the video of them trespassing. I'd actually be careful about this since OP's wife is hard of hearing. If the cops don't know this and don't catch on quickly and come when the wife is home alone, things might go the wrong way. 
I'd let the police know about what is going on and give them the footage yourself so that if and when this mother tries to call the police about this, they are forewarned with enough information on how to handle things properly. Second this, police have been known to beat deaf people for not complying with instructions. They beat people who can hear just fine for the same thing. You just have to stop resisting. What, are you deaf? <laughs> not the asshole. If anything, you have video evidence of them trespassing and you should have led with that. OP replies, I didn't really want to escalate the situation, I just wanted her to go away honestly. You can control the situation or be controlled by it. Guess which one works out better? This OP, next time this woman comes harassing you, call the police and press charges for trespassing. Worst case scenario is they keep trespassing, they could fall into your property or get bitten by your dog, and you will get sued. Yup, and if he doesn't have a paper trail that they've been trespassing all this time, when the worst case scenario happens, they'll say they allowed them to come in the back to get their ball. So protect yourself. And now onto the update. After reading through some responses, I decided to take action. I looked through my camera footage and found all the times they have entered my garden or kicked the ball over in the last few months and actually found one from January where they had actually come in and opened my rabbit cage up to find the rabbit. Luckily, my rabbit wasn't out there as it was winter. Following this, I went to the woman's house and met her husband. I explained what had happened and although he wasn't yelling like his wife, he didn't seem to care. So I explained I had evidence of his son trespassing on my property, damaging my property, and evidence of potential theft, since he was opening my rabbit cage and pulling on my shed door. At first he tried to laugh me off, but when I pulled up one of the videos on my phone and told him I was reporting this to the police, he stopped laughing, apologized, said he would speak to both his wife and son, and to please not involve the police. I politely thanked him and left. On my way home, I ran into one of the other parents and filled her in on what was going on. She immediately apologized for her son's involvement. Her son had never entered my property, but has helped lift the fence and kick the ball. She assured me that he would be grounded and have the footballs taken off him, and told if they ever do it again, I should pop the balls. I did call the non-emergency number and got it all logged, and the videos sent, and the kind lady on the phone informed me if it ever happens again, I can call and press charges. I can actually press charges now, but she advised me to wait as they will only get a warning, as this is the first time that it's been logged. This also means that if they do call to complain about theft, they will be informed of the logs against them, rather than any action against me. I've also informed my insurance company who assured me, since it is logged with the police and I have screwed my fences in, I am in the clear, but they also recommend I get a no trespassing sign, so I will do that at the weekend. Thank you so much for all of your help and advice. I will admit that I had absolutely no idea what to do about it or even if I had a stand legally, so thank you for all the information you have provided. In the comments, Shinebeat says, The difference between the two families' parents. The parents who shout about theft, when your child trespassed, and thought of stealing the rabbit, and showing indifference until the talk of police, versus the awesome parent who plans to ground the child and told OP to just pop the balls if they did it again. Wow, the audacity of that mother. I don't understand kids like that, or even parents. Anytime I accidentally yeeted a toy over the fence as a child, I completely wrote it off because just the thought of telling my parents or asking the neighbors to get it was mortifying. And if I had done it more than three times, my parents would have taken the toy away because clearly I couldn't be trusted with it. Jesus Christ, the audacity of that lady. To be honest, I kind of wonder why these kids are even playing there. Do they not have some place where they can play without risking a ball getting kicked into someone's garden? Having lived in a town, a lot of fields to play ball in border other people's property. 95% it goes well, and then someone kicks the ball too hard, or it bounces off at a different angle, or whatever, and it's in the property. You can ask for it back, and sometimes you have to wait until later. As a kid, I would sometimes jump the fence if no one was home, grab the ball, and leave without touching anything else. And while entering someone else's property is wrong, as a kid I wasn't focused on that aspect just on the not trying to annoy the neighbors again and making the least amount of disturbance possible. 
Does your town, city, whatever, have a field that is free of use for anyone, walking distance for kids, residential area, and not bordering someone else's property? Gumby Gump replies, This was my childhood too. It was always easier to take 5 seconds to hop the fence and grab the ball rather than take 10 minutes to go to the neighbor's house, spend 10 minutes knocking on the door hoping they hear it, then getting lectured as they got the ball. I never saw hopping the fence as a big deal as long as I just got the ball and didn't touch anything else. Balls are expensive, and I just wanted to keep playing. I guess my perspective on this one, as you heard from my opinion earlier, uh, I don't understand what is wrong with the mum, and big thumbs up to the dad. I don't blame him for wanting to pop the ball in this situation because if it is happening this many times, you're better off finding something else to do than pissing off your neighbours. But that's just me. I want to know what you guys think about this one. Let me know in the comments down below. Our next post is by user Overall Assignment 265 titled Am I the asshole for not leaving a cafe because my son was babbling? My wife and I went out for coffees and a pastry with our 8 month old son at a cafe near our local park. He has started babbling more often lately and loves to play with his toy. That doesn't make too much noise. We were seated outside and were enjoying our coffee and pastry and were enjoying the sun and our son's babbles while the weather is still not too hot. An older couple was seated after us a few tables over and they looked at us with a distaste and made a loud comment about how parents ruin going out for others with their babies. A few minutes of babbling later, she asked us if we could keep our son's voice down. I told her we would try but no promises. We put on Miss Rachel to try to keep him from making noise, but he would start clapping or babbling still. As we were about to finish and leave, she turned around and asked us to leave so she and her husband could enjoy their day out. I told her she came to a local park, sat at an outdoor cafe, and had no right to make us feel bad for going out with our son. She told me that she never took her kids out when they made noise, and we should take others into consideration. Her husband told her that that was enough, but I threw out a comment about how she should be ashamed of herself as a mother to make other parents feel bad for enjoying themselves, especially in a public place where noise should be expected. My wife told me that I should have kept that last comment out of it because it became personal, and a co-worker commented that I should have just ignored her and not said anything. My wife is now hesitant to go out to avoid me responding that way to another person. I think I'm in the clear, but... Am I the asshole? Edit 1. Wow, this blew up, and thank you for the nice comments. Regarding the video, it was at iPhone volume level 2. Just enough for baby to hear, but we barely heard it from a foot and a half away. Regarding the toy, it's like a plastic toy with rubber strings. It makes a rubber sound that does make noise, but not loud enough that it's annoying like the toys with speakers. Honestly, I'm going with not the asshole for this one. I just think she should have kept her mouth shut. I feel like honestly, there's no ifs or buts about it. She shouldn't have said anything. She should have kept her mouth shut. She knows what it's like to be a mother, yet she attacks you. Your rebuttal to her nonsense was acceptable, and I like the way that you went about it, OP. She deserved everything you said to her, and I don't think that you went over the top at all. And I don't think that anything you said was unnecessary, so not the asshole. In the comments, Worldly Instance 730 says... Not the asshole. You're right. If they don't want to hear everyday noises, they can stay home. Enjoy your son's babbling. It turns into teenage silence way too quick. Not the asshole. She should have followed her own advice. If she can't shut up and make nonsense noise, she should have stayed at home. Right? Everyone has a turn at being a noisy little kid, then you get a little bit older and it's someone else's go, and so on and so forth. We've all done it, so we all should put up with it. Honestly, this OP has provided me with the easiest not the asshole decision that I have ever had to make in nearly a year of Reddit. P.S. Why do people who get so annoyed at even the existence of others bother to go out in public? I hate being in public, but if I have to go, I bring my patience. BDSM Queen says, Not the asshole. I'm sick and tired of this hatred that has become popular against kids in public spaces. Baby babble is adorable and necessary for their development. You did nothing wrong. People just need to get over the fact that sometimes they will have to share a public space with children. We live in a society. Get over it. Not everyone finds the babbling to be adorable. I wouldn't confront or say anything to the parents because it's a communal space and that comes with the risk of being annoyed by other people. 
I don't find the babbling adorable. However, I don't own the public space, and kids should be allowed to exist. This right here. I kind of hate kids and the noise, but it's a public space. And unless the kid is throwing a fit, there is no reason for parents with young children to have to leave. Aside from that, how are kids expected to learn to conduct themselves in a public space if parents are expected to keep them out of sight all the time? That just guarantees that you will have your kid act out in public if you never take them out in public. And on top of that, an outdoor cafe next to a park is a pretty perfect spot to start teaching a child how to behave in a restaurant. If the kid gets restless, it's easy for one parent to take them for a walk. If they cry, it's easy to step away to calm them. There aren't any walls amplifying the sound. It sounds like OP did everything we expect parents to do when introducing their child to the world. Definitely not the asshole. Posted by user Difficult Article 19, titled Am I the asshole for inviting my fiance's younger sister to our wedding? I, female 25, am engaged to my fiance, male 32. We've been dating for four years before getting engaged last year. We've always gotten along well with each other's families and celebrated holidays together. Both of our families were happy when we announced our engagement. I recently found out that my fiancé actually has a 15-year-old younger sister, let's call her Anne, who I never met despite her living at her parents and me visiting often. When I asked about her during a family dinner, they glared at me and coldly said that I shouldn't mention her and that I should just forget about her. The intense response kind of shocked me, so I dropped the subject, but I tried to talk about it with my fiancé after we got home. He brushed it off and said Anne doesn't want to be a part of the family, so she's not allowed to join any family events or gatherings until she decides to talk to them. Maybe because I'm generally a curious person, but something just felt off. Even at my fiancé's parents' home, there are pictures of their children everywhere, but there is not a single picture of Anne. A few days later, I contacted Anne, saying that I'd love to get to know my future sister-in-law. We met up at a cafe, and she is such a sweet girl but it turns out she's mute. She can hear, but just can't talk. Her parents got it into their heads that she's able to talk, but chooses not to, because there is no way a child of them would have a disability, so they excluded Anne from the family until she talks. We talked, well I talked, she wrote, I don't know sign language, and I really feel sorry for her. I invited her to my wedding, telling her that I'd love to see her there. When I later told this during a family dinner with my fiancé's family, they blew up, telling me how I dared to talk to Anne and to revoke my invitation, because if Anne doesn't want to talk to them, she doesn't deserve to be a part of the family and shouldn't be allowed to join in family events. They told me that I shouldn't stick my nose in their family business. My fiancé sided with his parents, telling me to just forget Anne exists and apologize to his parents. This angered me because I thought my fiancé would have my back, and I yelled at them that I am not going to uninvite her, that she deserved to be treated better. Since then, my fiancé has been constantly telling me that I'm behaving like a child, throwing a tantrum, and to apologize to his family for my behavior. But I just can't accept the way that Anne is treated. It also made me worry if we end up having children, would my fiancé treat our child the same way if they'd end up having a disability of some kind? Some of my friends are also saying that I should just let it go and not overreact so much. That every family does things their own way, so I should just apologize and do as they tell me to prevent my relationship from suffering. Am I the asshole for inviting Anne to my wedding after having learned how my fiancé and his family thinks about her? Let's step back for a second, OP. Anne is mute. She cannot help the fact that she is mute. Yet this family refuses to allow her to participate in anything, and they don't even acknowledge her existence and they tell you to forget about her. Yes, if you have a child, they will absolutely treat this child that way. If you continue down this path, you are condemning future children to this behavior and you are also showing that you accept this behavior from them. If you go ahead with this wedding, you're the asshole for enabling and accepting this behavior. Not the asshole for wanting to invite Anne to your wedding, but I feel like that pales in comparison to the bigger question of, what are you still doing with this guy? I will judge you as an asshole if you continue with them. In the comments, LC78 says, Info, 
Why aren't you calling off this marriage after seeing how horrible your fiancé and his family truly are? Imagine how they'll treat your future children if they aren't perfect. I'd consider filing a report with children's services. This is concerning. This is the reply. What happens when your child is the wrong type of imperfect? What are the acceptable types of imperfect? Are glasses okay? Braces? ADHD? Depression? Gender issues? Religious issues? I'd bet serious money that if they had a kid with a peanut allergy, grandma and grandpa would go on about the kid being picky and sneak them peanuts every chance they get. Kronkla Sorda says, This is child abuse. You should call Child Protective Services on the parents. Anne needs to get therapy and support for her disability. Good from 70 says, Wow, reread this post and ask yourself who the problem is. In the off chance that Anne isn't even a mute and is faking it, this would still be way out of bounds for the family to behave this way toward her. We have no true insight to your relationship with the fiancé, but this whole situation just tells me your fiancé and his parents are bad people. That poor kid. If she's faking it, she has a mental illness, which is also a disability. I've worked with many selective mutes. They never seem to have issues speaking with their family. But do those families suck as much as this one, though? What if the family is the cause of the selective mutism? I'm not experienced in this, but can't abuse be one of, many, possible causes of that? Yes, it can. More the reason for OP to run if this post is real. And now, on to the update. Hello everyone. I wanted to reply to everyone in the thread that I made, but by the time I woke up, it had already been locked. Because of the word limit, I wasn't able to write more clearly, so I'm sorry for that. I am writing this to clarify a few things and give an update. About calling child services. I don't live in America or Europe, and where I live, child services aren't really great nor reliable. I worry that if they get involved, it will end up being worse for Anne. A lot of people made the assumption that Anne is locked up. This is not the case. She can go outside when she wants, she has a phone, laptop, and internet access, she even has a part-time job. It's just that her family doesn't involve her with anything and ignores her presence. Anne said to me that she tried to have a connection, but gave up and is now just waiting until she can move out. Whenever I visited their home, it was only for a few hours at a time, and I just never had any reason to go upstairs. That was until the bathroom at the ground floor was broken, and I had to use the upstairs one. After I learned about her, I contacted her through social media. For information on her being mute, she said to me that it was a birth defect that caused her to be physically unable to make sounds. Apparently this is what the doctors told her parents when she was young, but they chose not to believe it. Now for the update to the situation. Yesterday, I tried to have a serious talk with my fiancé, but it resulted in another big fight, and I decided to break off our engagement. After having read all the replies, I finally started noticing the patterns and red flags in his behavior, and I feel stupid for not having seen them earlier. I said to him that if he ever wants to have a chance with me again, he needs to fix his and his family's behavior and start treating Anne better. I said to him that if Anne is such a burden to them, to send her to my place instead. I don't know what will come of that, but I put the offer out there. I sent Anne a message with this as well. I'm now sending text messages to Anne a lot, so I will try to keep in contact at least. In the comments, GreenOlive123 says, I wonder how the fiancé answered when she asked him what would happen if they had a kid that was disabled or mute. Probably, well, that's different, since obviously Anne is faking it. Sarcasm, by the way. That was my first thought. I wish OP had pointedly asked, what if we have a child with a disability? Will you claim that they're faking it? Not even their future kid. What if OP herself suffers something like postpartum depression? Will he and his family turn on her for faking it for XYZ reasons, disparage her and urge him to leave her? If Anne's disability, that is physiologically diagnosed, is disbelieved by these geniuses, what more a mental problem? Lol, it doesn't even make sense. Anne prefers not to speak and delights in being ignored by her entire family her whole life. Geniuses. My instinct from the title was that she'd be the asshole, since there's usually a good reason a sibling isn't invited, but nope. At first I thought she was going to be the asshole because it is supremely shitty to go around your spouse's back to contact family that they are no contact with, but then... That was forgotten given how supremely shitty this whole situation is. 
Personally, I would have cancelled the wedding when I found out about the situation before even thinking of inviting her. The idea of shunning a child or sibling because they were born mute is a non-starter for me. Me too. I would have cancelled the wedding and invited Anne to live with me. I really fear though that her actions and invitation could make things worse for Anne, especially if they decide to blame her for the broken engagements. That's what I fear too, and why I would want Anne to live with me. Sadly, this is incredibly normal with mutism and selective mutism, and honestly all sorts of invisible disabilities. Parents don't want to believe that their genes created something imperfect. They'd rather convince themselves that their child is an asshole, or lazy, or attention-seeking, or insert negative personality adjective, than acknowledge that their kid is disabled. Even parents who think that they are being understanding and kind about their kid's disability are often affected by the lack of visual evidence. I can't count the number of times I've been told, if you can do tasks that I'm physically able to do, you should be able to do harder, more complicated task that is in no way related to the first one that they mentioned. I can't imagine what it would be like growing up with parents who are full-on mask off about their ableism. Honestly, this is just really painful to think about, and I do hope that Anne gets the help that she needs and gets out of there, but that seems to be three years away, and who knows what Opie's ex's family will decide to do. This just sucks all around. I am hoping that the best outcome comes of this, and I think Opie made the right choice in this instance. Although, now that Opie is in contact with Anne... You would think that naturally, they would be pushing to help Anne as much as they possibly can. What do you guys think of this one? I'd love to know your thoughts down in the comments below. Our next post is by user Throw RA Slept With Her, titled, Girlfriend is being forced to marry someone she doesn't want to. How do I help her? I, 26 male, was dating this girl M, 25 female. We had been dating for over a year, but she came from a very, very strict Indian family. She said she was lucky that they allowed her to work, and they would be extremely against her dating someone, that they wanted her to get married to a guy of their choice. We met at college, ended up at the same company. We had sex several times, which she said was a big no-no, so she wanted to keep it a secret, which I did. Eight months ago, out of the blue, I received a message from her. It said we were done and she didn't want me to contact her again. We hadn't had a fight. In fact, we had a romantic dinner just the night before, and yet I got this message. I called her several times, sent her texts and everything. I even planned to go to her house and talk to her, but decided against it due to her family. I even tried calling some friends of hers, but they just said that she had ghosted them too. I was heartbroken. And after two months, I decided to get back out there, but just couldn't find someone with that same spark. I had basically given up on dating and started focusing on my career, and I recently even landed a very high-paying job. I was happy, yet lonely. Three days ago, I got a message from one of her friends. She said M was at her place and had been there for nearly a week, and she was asking to meet me. I was hesitant and asked her if she was playing a cruel joke on me after the way that we broke up, to which the friend broke down crying, to my surprise, and said she couldn't explain over the phone. I went there and sure enough, M was sitting there. She looked thinner, a bit paler, and very, very sad. She saw me, started crying, and hugged me, and then we sat down to talk. She said her family had seen us together, and when she went home that night, she was yelled at. She lives in a big joint family, so her parents, grandmom, three uncles and aunts, and about 13 cousins live under the same roof. She said they took away her phone, prevented her from going to work or contacting anyone. They said they had pressured her into telling them how far our relationship had gone, and when it was revealed that she wasn't a virgin, her family went berserk. They shifted her to their rural village and arranged her marriage with a family friend who was 60 to 65, and when she tried to refuse, they threatened to kill her. She said she played along for a month, and that a week or so ago the marriage date was decided to be in September. She said she told her family she wanted to spend time with her 2B husband and managed to slip away, after which she took a train to get back here. I had shifted to a bigger house and wasn't on any social media, so she didn't know where I was and went to her friend. She stayed there for a few days, resting and crying, worrying her family would find her before asking to meet me. 
I have no idea what to do here and how to proceed. I love her and I'm willing to be there for her, but I have absolutely no idea how. What legal steps can we take? In the comments, Cordobono says, she's legally an adult and technically they can't do anything to get her back. I would say make sure that your home has security cameras around in case they come to your home. See if she can file for a restraining order as well. Lost Texanian says, well, she's an adult and if they try and take her somewhere, that's abduction. She needs to find another job somewhere and start focusing on building her life back up. I'm not sure about the aid available where you are or the legal rights the state gives, but here in the US, there is a bunch of organizations to help with battered and abused women. I'm certain if you look in India, you'll find groups who can help protect your girlfriend. These groups know the local laws and how willing the police are in protecting women who are in danger. Reddit's a big place. Search here for a group slash subreddit with the information you two need and do an online search as well. You may want some extra steps in securing yourself as well. Stay dark on social media. Remove some of the details you just posted here. Don't be out in public in this community without disguising yourselves. This family might be capable of doing anything. And OP replies, Thank you so much, mate. We're actually discussing a court marriage between the two of us if necessary, and I'll definitely look into some organizations. And now, on to the update. So a while ago, I had made a post here asking for help because my girlfriend was being forced to marry someone that she didn't want to. This is the update to that. We got married. We married in Arya Samaj Mandia, which is just a way of saying we got married the fastest way possible legally, got the marriage certificate, and made the legal adjustments, changing details on passport, Arda card, etc. She's seeing a therapist now, and is mentally better, and she isn't that scared now. Her family did find out, and did try to lodge a case that I was holding her against her will, or that she has been brainwashed by me, but an affidavit thanks to Soy Sucks' fantastic advice disproved all of that. Her brother did send some threats, and her dad actually tried to enter my house, but in the end, they had no choice but to accept it, and left to go to their hometown. My wife and I blocked them on everything, and we haven't had any contact from them for a while now, so we don't think that they'll be a problem anymore. Now that all the legal craziness and family drama has been dealt with, we're going to start adjusting as husband and wife. We're planning a proper wedding celebration with all our friends, who are basically our family. We'll also go on a honeymoon soon. I'm glad that things worked out as well as they could for us, and I'm going to look forward to spending the rest of my life with a fantastic woman. I'd like to specifically thank some people on here before ending the update. Soy sucks for taking the time from his day to give me some fantastic legal advice. Pranibus for his great advice and suggestions. Secondhand Bra for listening to my ramblings and steering me in the right directions. Lastly, thank you to everyone who commented on my post. I read each and every one, and they were all helpful in some way. In the comments, Patron of Lost Girls says, You need to move. They know your address and they have connections with local law enforcement. Congratulations on the wedding. Stay vigilant. And OP replies, Moving isn't an option right now, but my place has security cameras and I had previously hired a security company whose guards are still there. Thickar asks, Can someone explain the affidavit part? And OP replies, It's a legal document signed by my wife that says that she has married me on her own will and I didn't force her to marry me in any way. We made this document just before our marriage on someone's advice in case her family tried something. They tried to declare that I had kidnapped and brainwashed her and they were here to take her back. But when we produced a document which said that she had married me of her free will and hadn't been coerced in any way, the case was thrown out. False Premise asks, What was their plan after that? Have your marriage annulled and force her to marry the other guy? Or was that impossible and they were just bitter and wanted her to suffer? And OP replies, Probably get me arrested and then take her away. Our marriage would get annulled because I would have been convicted for coercing her, no matter what she would say, and then she'd get married to someone who she didn't want to marry. But wouldn't they just say that you forced her to sign that document? I'm glad this seems like a happy ending, but stay careful. And OP says, That's why she signed it in front of the city magistrate. If they would have tried to say that, the magistrate could be called upon and he'd prove it wrong. OP provides some other comments on why OP's wife's family tried to marry her off to a much older man. A couple of reasons. One, 
Old guys are typically rich, can bring honor to their family, etc. Two, it's their sick way of punishing their daughter. And three, she isn't a virgin, so she's considered damaged in her village. It's an absolutely disgusting thing, but it's the sad reality. Since she's damaged, no young guy our age will go for her because they're all traditional sea bags. An old guy looking for a maid won't mind all of that, so that's another reason. On why OP was not considered a good marriage prospect, I don't have a good family. I don't have any living family members left. You're a good person. Assuming they don't want her to be with me because they think that she'll be unhappy with me, that her unhappiness is at the forefront of their minds. The only thing that they want their daughter for is to boost their image by marrying her into a big, lovely family. I don't have any family, so their daughter marrying me won't bolster their image in any way. Well guys, I'm done posting on here for now, since things have settled down for now. There is still one major change we have to make in our lives, and if I remember this account, I'll make a final update after that's done. Thanks everyone who commented on my posts, for your wishes and advice, stay good. And now, onto the final update. A few months ago, I made a post asking for help, as my girlfriend at the time was being forced to marry someone she didn't want to. There was a lot of messed up stuff going on, but suitable precautions were taken and we managed to stay safe for some time. However, most of you said that we were not really safe and that we had to move away and go somewhere to really be safe. In the whole process, we also ended up getting married. Some people claimed that I used the situation to my advantage and not for the good of the woman that I love. I'll address all of this now. We moved away. I won't say where for obvious reasons, but we did, and we are not in the country anymore. We have settled down in this new place nicely, and already made new friends, while keeping contact with the old ones. A few people were wondering what the hell I did for work as I seem to have unlimited money, other than saying that I work in a very select field, and that it's completely legal, I won't say anything. Now, as we were out of country, I asked my wife if she'd like to get the marriage annulled if she thought that it happened too soon. My communication skills are so dumb that she thought that I was asking for a divorce and broke down crying. Those were a fun couple of hours. On to the juicier parts of the update. Her family called up some of my friends and asked where we were. They responded with a simple, I don't know, and they didn't at the time. One of my wife's cousins attacked someone that I knew and ended up with a beating he'll never forget. Kids, it's never a good idea to attack someone who walks around with three bodyguards. Now, as I like to make everything about myself, how am I holding up? I have a nice house, several friends, a lot of money, and a million other blessings that I'm lucky to have. But one shines above all these. I'm married to the most beautiful woman I've ever laid eyes on. Her old energy has returned, her happiness is back, and she is breathtakingly beautiful, in every single way possible. I'm married to an absolute bombshell, not just in looks, but also in personality. Wow. So yes, I'd say I am doing pretty well too. It took some time to get settled in, but still happened relatively quickly. Overall, mood is pretty good now. We had some paranoia initially. We thought we saw some of her family members in the new place, but it was all a false alarm. I've still put every security measure I could think of in our house, and I truly think that we are safe now. That's all I really have to say now, and there's nothing more to update, so I guess goodbye, and thank you everyone for your support. TLDR, moved away, happy, safe, and pleasant all around. In the comments, Live Without Love says, the moment I saw the post title, I knew it was probably going to be my country. Our effing society is too backwards and not going to progress much in this lifetime. Glad this story turned out well and didn't end up with another honor killing. Yeah, I hear ya. Thankfully, I feel that things have gotten a little better than when my parents were living there. How do they get away with honor killings? Where's the police in all of this? Also, this story would have a very different ending if OP didn't have a lot of money. Greco AP replies, well they're helping the crowd with the honor killings. I mean, how do police officers get away with shooting people or harassing people of color? Think about all the race-related crimes that we hear about in the news where the police did nothing or ones related to assault. It's hard to imagine from a Western perspective, but it's the same underlying bullshit in a different form. 
ingrained, prejudiced, corruption, and the inherent power trips you get from the police. You just need one person to close up an investigation, saying that it was a suicide or an accident. Who's going to come forward and say that it wasn't, when they could be next? Respect other cultures is great as a general principle, but there are some traditions in some cultures that aren't worthy of respect. That includes my culture, by the way. XTN fundamentals make life hell for many people. I had a girlfriend once from the Indian subcontinent. The whole time we went out, her parents knew nothing, and it was a whole continuing drama of secrecy. Zero out of ten, would not do again. There was an Armenian-American guy I knew who had a girlfriend whose family was from the subcontinent. They refused to accept the relationship, but she held firm despite all kinds of drama, and she cut them off after they gave her an ultimatum. So then the family welcomed him, rebuilt the relationship with her, only to give her an ultimatum once she was back in the fold. So she once again cut them off. I was mighty impressed. It's scary how much control some people want to be able to have over women, I hope OP and his wife continue to live safely and happily. Not Indian, but my husband recently reminded me that my own freaking younger brother thinks that my husband needs to control me. So does the husband of a dear friend. These are college-educated men, opposite ends of the political spectrum slash religion, and both of those idiots think that I'm some kind of possession, object, or animal, just because I'm not an obsequious, quiet lady. My husband says that I'm not a dog and he loves me just as I am. Miss Chris 2020 says, I'm glad they left the country and are safe now. Traditionally minded Indians can be next level when it comes to these things. I had a friend in high school, Hindu, that had a sister that died in a car accident. Turns out, she didn't actually die, she just married a Muslim guy, was disowned by the family, and they told everyone that their daughter died. I'm in Canada and we have a fair amount of Indian folks living here, or brown people in general from various places in the world, and I have so many friends who have been highly pressured to get married very young, been refused marriage to their non-brown partner, or had hidden relationships for years before dumping the significant other for the parent-approved wife. It is so sad. I get wanting to preserve culture and traditions, but it's so tough on the kids who are raised in a different country with a foot in both cultures. Customs and cultures are nice to have, but if you have to use coercion or manipulation to preserve your culture, then it's a shit culture and deserves to die. Posted by user, Am I the A-hole gifted school, titled, Am I the asshole for not sending my daughter to a different school district so she could be in gifted education? I have three kids, Michelle 7, Juliet 6, and Leo 2. Michelle and Juliet are in kindergarten and first grade at our local public school. Juliet, however, is very gifted. She came into kindergarten reading chapter books and was doing math at a second grade level. She's obviously doing great academically, but struggles socially at her school for a couple of reasons. Firstly, she doesn't understand that other people's brains don't work like hers and tends to get frustrated when people take a bit longer to figure things out. Second, she's just a huge bookworm and would rather spend recess reading instead of playing with the other kids. Then she gets upset that she can't talk about her books with them. I was recently called into a meeting about Juliet with her teacher, the principal of her school, and the superintendent. They basically said that they don't have the resources to support Juliet in her school or any schools in the district, but there's a school two towns over specifically for gifted students from 1st to 10th grade. Then for the 11th and 12th grade, they have a building at a community college, and she would be taking college courses for high school and college credits. She would have to test into the school, but her school will provide the testing. The school sounds great for her, but it's close to 30 minutes away from her current school. It starts and ends 45 minutes later than her current school, so I'd still be able to get her and Michelle to school on time, but it would eat up at least two extra hours of my day, and I don't have that kind of time for school drop-off and pick-up nor do I have the patience to deal with a two-year-old in the car for two hours per day. My husband works in the opposite direction and wouldn't be able to drop her off. We could ask my father-in-law. He sometimes drives the kids around for me, but I don't want to have him drop off and pick up two hours per day. My husband does not agree with me at all. He thinks I should be willing to make the drive for her and insists that I have the time because I'm a stay-at-home mom. I brought up the issue of having Leo spending that much time in the car, but he says that I could just have his parents babysit. 
I still don't think that it's worth the two hours per day that I would have to put in to take her to this school, so I went through with enrolling her in our local public school for next year, and my husband is furious with me for ignoring her social and academic needs. Am I the asshole for not enrolling her in the gifted school because it would take too much time to get her to and from school? I'm just gonna go with yes, absolutely. You have more than enough capability and options to make this work, yet you refuse to do so. To the detriment of your child's social development, I do think that you're an asshole for doing that, yes. You have no other excuse besides not wanting to do it. The two-year-old in the car is not an excuse. There are people there to babysit. Stop making excuses. You're the asshole. In the comments, Outrageously Penguin says, You're the asshole for just saying no outright when you do have options to make this work. You could at least have asked the in-laws if they'd be willing to help out, perhaps with a combo of rides and babysitting, and you went ahead and enrolled her in a different school against your husband's wishes? That's messed up. This. It sounds like you didn't even ask her at all, either. This is her education that we're talking about. She might be a pretty young child, but the entire point is that she is advanced and not being challenged where she is. You are taking away the opportunity for her to actually learn and move forward in an environment that will challenge her, and instead, you want to leave her in one that's likely going to be boring and annoying, one where she doesn't seem to fit in with her peers either, and all because you don't want to drive a little more? Did you look into any type of transportation, ask about school buses for her or the other kids, see what other parents might be able to help out, or the in-laws you decided you didn't want to inconvenience without even speaking to? You're the asshole. At least pretend to try before you outright shut down this opportunity. PSA Warrior replies, exactly. My mother ended up arranging for me to carpool with other kids and even teachers who lived nearby because we didn't have a car and the school was an hour away. OP isn't trying at all and doesn't care that her kid is going to be so bored she's going to stop paying attention entirely and end up falling behind as a result. So instead of a prodigy, she's going to end up with an angry and disillusioned dropout. OP doesn't want to waste two hours a day driving to a better school, but doesn't mind her child wasting eight hours a day in a school that themselves say they don't have the resources to help her. You're the asshole. This. I think your point is spot on, and I want to make another. OP is all concerned about sacrificing her time to the point where she is sacrificing her child. True. However, I'm not convinced that OP has all the information and is not really grasping what she is potentially doing to her child. If she really gets it and is still not wanting to make the effort, then it's my educated belief that she's willing to neglect her child's needs in a way that is not borderline abusive, it is straight up abuse. Yes, I said it, and here's why. There's a lot of anecdotal stories here from people who are intellectually gifted as children, as well as parents weighing in, and of course people will have a variety of experiences. I'm a retired academic and educator, high school and college, and as I'm old and tired, I'll keep it brief. In addition to having stories about genius children from my own family, I have had thousands of students over the years, but don't listen to me. The data, and there is quite a bit in several disciplines, completely holds up that kids with advanced intellectual abilities are far, far more likely to thrive when they are educated in environments where they are stimulated and supported, like most kids. Yes, of course, duh. But the needs of really smart kids are specialized, and the rewards versus risks are measurably and distinctly higher. There are literally, not figuratively folks, literally, volumes and volumes on this. Full stop. OP, you're the asshole. I implore you to do your job as a parent, as your elder, I am telling you to get the F off your ass, educate yourself about how important this is, and get your goddamn kid the education she deserves. F and A, lady. One day, back in the Mesozoic era, your daughter can probably explain when that was, by the way, I took my fancy education, and I left high school to teach college students. Why? Because I couldn't deal with shitty, apathetic parents anymore. And now, onto the update. I found out that my husband took Juliet to get tested for the gifted school behind my back, and she got in. After he found out that she was accepted, he let our housekeepers go. We have housekeepers come twice a week, and cancelled my gym membership to pay for a service to drive her to and from school, all without telling me. As a result of his actions, I'm currently staying with my parents, and we will be getting a divorce. 
Juliet will be starting her new school in July, it's one of those year-round schools, and my soon-to-be ex just had to tear our family apart to make it happen. I hope you're all happy with the outcome. In the comments, Extreme Chemistry 515 asks, So, you want a divorce because your husband figured out the best way to help your child? You don't deserve your family. OP replies, He can't make decisions about my life without consulting me. Soulless Sultry Voice replies, You had all of your finances provided by your husband. You had housekeepers. You have a whole support system you could have called on to help get your daughter to the school that she needs to go to. And you weren't even willing to try that. Just like any other job where you refuse to do even the bare minimum, you were fired from this job. A job with better benefits than anything you'll find in the professional realm with an entry-level career. Now you're going to get a taste of how the majority of the world works to raise their kids because you got selfish and entitled with the vast amount of luxury and privilege you had. Now you're going to have to find a job, and you'll have to find out that it's very hard to find one re-entering the workforce that gives you all of the benefits that you need and will allow you enough income to pay for housekeeping twice a week, a gym membership, and childcare when you're out of the house working after you've paid your bills to keep a roof over your head and the lights on. Get ready for a dose of harsh, harsh reality. Leopard Eater replies, Nah, she's not going to learn a thing. She's not going to fight for custody of her children. She will either dump them with dad or try for custody to then dump them on her parents. She will threaten the parents that they will never see their grandchildren again unless they pay for her lifestyle if she's successful in getting custody. OP, you're one of the most selfish people I have ever had the displeasure of coming across. As a fellow stay-at-home mum, let me spell this out for you. It is literally your job to take care of your children. Do you even have to do any housework if you have two housekeepers? So literally all you have to do is take care of your children. Grow the hell up and give your children what they need. Have fun in your divorce trial. You'll lose. That's where you are headed. You royally screwed up, super massive big time. You are an entitled, stuck-up, selfish person in the highest possible degree. I can't at this time recall even a remotely close similar individual as bad as these traits that you are. So, let me paint you a picture. Not only would this message be a hellish lot more cruel, crude, obscene, and horrible if I had a free reign to express myself away from the rules, which I don't think I'm following very well, but I hope I do get leniency for, but this is spread to other websites and across the globe. You were universally disliked, to be very, very nice about it. I would like to include the word loathe, so you know how high it goes. There are not few others who had similar situations growing up, some recent and some multiple decades ago, as some are old grandmas now, who wrote about this and were not happy regarding this or their own situation. One that had a mother in a very similar situation said almost verbatim that they hated their mother with every fiber of their own being. This seems to be the circumstances that you are rushing towards, just much worse. I don't want you back in status quo again, but for the children, I kind of do perhaps. So if you are lucky and still have a husband that loves you and can forgive your transgressions in tantrum, which I suspect it is not the first, you might have a semblance of a good life. Otherwise, well, let's just say F-A-F-O. I feel like these people just took the words right out of my mouth. I'd love to know what you guys think of this wonderful story in the comments down below. Our next post is by user FarConnection6368, titled, My Mother Refuses to Give Me Back My Nine-Month-Old Son. As stated in the title, my mother is outright refusing to give me back my son. To keep it short, she offered to watch him for a few days while I was sorting out a move across states, Florida to Texas. The move came around sooner than expected, and all hell broke loose. It's been a nightmare since my pregnancy, but I digress. I'm not currently in Florida, I'm in Texas sorting things out. My husband is down in Florida though, so I asked him to pick up our son from my mum's. For more than one reason, one being my mum is a narcissist, and she had been calling me with really concerning behaviour. She then refused to hand him to my husband, reasons being, we are making a mistake, don't take him from me, you are horrible parents, I do not want my son to be there. The cops were called and they informed us that they couldn't do anything because it wasn't their department, so they couldn't just grab my son and hand him over. Is that really it? What can I do to get my son back if the cops won't do anything? They told me that we could take it up with the family court, but we will, one, not be able to afford that, and two, not be able to stay in Florida for a case to begin with. 
My son is only nine months old. I really don't want to have to put him through that. Is there any possible other way to proceed? In the comments, N8HBL says, I am a lawyer, not your lawyer, this is not legal advice, etc. Okay, you are dealing with a moron slash lazy cop. The normal speech is, this is a custody matter and that is not a crime. Talk to a supervisor and file charges, this is likely a crime. Here's the statute on custodial interference. This is 100% a crime in Florida and most states really. Relatives don't have a special not kidnapping exception in any state's law. The cop made the ignorant assumption that the both of you have a claim to this child. She or he didn't want to deal with it, so be it. Mad Skills replies, Yeah, she needs to explain that the grandma has zero legal custody, she was just babysitting. I'm not a lawyer, but it sounds like the cop is confusing this situation with that of a divorced couple who has an agreement to custody. That's not the case here. She doesn't have a custody agreement, she can't just keep him. Call the cops again and ask for a supervisor. Just wow, Florida. Sadie Boohoo asks, Why didn't your husband just take his child? This makes no sense. Something is missing. And OP replies, My stepfather had threatened physical violence if my husband got near. The cops also said that it'd be considered trespassing if my husband got near the house. Jolly Green Spartan says, and then husband harms OP's mum, or she claims she was harmed, and gets charged with assault? OP says, if anyone gets hurt in general. My siblings are also living with him as well, so if anything happens to them, it'd be a whole other situation. My family can and will get physical if anything sets them off. We're trying to not let it come to that. Was your husband warned to stay away from the property before all of this? OP replies, he was. He called my parents before getting there to let them know that he was on his way and to please have everything ready. During that phone call was when my stepfather threatened him to stay away or he would get physical. Well, at that point, your husband should have just called the police and tell them that he is picking up his child, he has legal custody, and his in-laws have physically threatened him and he would like their presence. And now, on to the update. I have goodish news. My son is back home. I landed in Florida at around 12am. I wanted to go straight to my mother's house and grab my son, but many advised against it so I waited anxiously until later in the day. Before getting there, she called me on the phone. I tried to get her to message me instead, but she refused and talked over me. She informed me that she was going to give me my son, but to not be too happy. She said she's going to call the courts on Monday to tell them that my son was going to be unsafe. She is hard set on believing something terrible will happen to him in our care. I'm not sure why. When we picked up our son, all of his things were ready, as I requested, so I was glad. One of my sisters was recording. I'm thankful she was because you can clearly hear my stepfather hurl insults and threats at us in the background. The whole time my family kept giving us dirty looks. My middle sister even threw some of the items at my husband. We left quickly after that. Very little words were exchanged. My family soon messaged me after trying to make me feel bad for making my mother cry. They sure weren't worried when I was crying over my son practically being held hostage. I'm trying to prepare myself for a possible CPS visit. All our stuff is packed away in boxes, so I'm not sure if that's okay or how it'll work out. By the time we got home, it was too late to call the sheriff's office, so I'll be calling them in the morning to file a restraining order against my mother and stepfather. My husband also wants to sue them for essentially kidnapping our son, but we're still in the process of dealing with everything else. I'd like to thank everyone who gave me their advice on how to deal with the situation, and all the good wishes were greatly appreciated. It really helped me keep a level head. A few things I should have probably mentioned in the original post. One, we are people of color, I feel like you'll be able to understand what I mean. My parents also don't speak English very well. 2. My husband is biologically and legally my son's father. And 3. My mother has zero custody of my son and neither does my stepfather. These were just common things that got brought up in the comments, so I just wanted to clarify. We still have 6 days left in Florida. A lot of things could happen in that time period. My mother has no evidence whatsoever to back her claims though, so I'm not extremely worried, I'm just nervous. I wish I could understand what's driving her to act this way, but talking to her is near impossible. And now onto the final update. Freedom at last. 
I am finally free from my mother's and stepfather's tyrannical rule. It is extremely bittersweet. I'm so used to having to depend on my mother for every single thing, big or small. There will be no more yelling, no more hitting and throwing, no more manipulating. I've got no contact with my mother's side of the family. They're all just as messed up. I was able to reconnect with my biological father, and lord, the stories he's telling me. I still jump at closing doors, car beeps, footsteps, and arguing, but I'm working on it. I'm working hard, not only for me, but for my new family as well. They need me present for them, and that is what I'll do. I am better than the trauma that my mother inflicted on me, and I will work twice as hard to never have my son experience what I did. I can say with slightly shaky confidence that I am free. In the comments, No Definition says, Kidnapping isn't the cops department? What the hell are they there for? I posted this in another sub yesterday, but I think it belongs here too. I grew up in an abusive household in an upper middle class neighborhood. Called the cops more times than I could count, begging for help, and they did nothing. No CPS follow-ups, no investigation, just, you're related, so this is a civil matter, and you need to figure this out amongst yourselves. Despite the fact I was like 11 years old and directly telling the cops that showed up that I feared for my life. I went back to my hometown a few years ago and got attacked by my abuser again, this time as an adult. When I asked to press charges, the officer I talked to said that I should sleep on it because we're related and refused to do the paperwork because his shift was ending and it was a Friday of a long weekend. Cops are useless. Added to add, quote, I still jump at closing doors, car beeps, footsteps, etc. This is so important. PTSD doesn't just come from war. When you've grown up around fits of rage, violence, or other traumatic environments, that stuff doesn't just go away when you move out. Neural pathways in our brains physically change as a result of trauma, and it is hard to set them right again. But all the work is worth it to get yourself back, for you and the people you love. I know it doesn't help now, but if you ever find a cop telling you that they won't handle the issue, then you become the issue. Request the next level up. Keep requesting up the chain until someone takes you seriously. Inform them that you will be more than happy to have your lawyers address this with them on your behalf if they won't file your report now. Even if you don't have a lawyer, they don't need to know that. Cops will take the laziest option available to do the least amount of work. Make dealing with you and filing the report the laziest option available. Once they realize that you aren't going away, you do know your rights, and you are more than willing to follow up on this, they suddenly become much more agreeable to filing that report. If you have the time to spare, call around until you find the number for complaints to internal affairs. External affairs is better if the department has it, but not all have one. And file a complaint about the officers that refuse to help you. Get their badge numbers, names, and keep records of who you spoke to, when, and the outcomes. You won't see immediate justice, but after enough of these reports stack up, the department finally starts to see some consequences for their inaction. Personally, I'm glad that things worked out for OP and they were able to get the hell away from that abusive family. I do like including uh, comments like this because I feel like, you know, these are perspectives that could help people that don't realize these are options for them. I personally don't like dealing with the police myself, but my mother was a lawyer, and this is exactly what I've come to expect from her. I used to cringe at how she would always ask for the next person up and scream at people when they weren't helping her, but it works surprisingly well. Uh, just do it the right way and be respectful about it. Anyway, what do you guys think of this one? What's your hot take? Let me know in the comments down below. Our next post is by user anywolf134, titled... Am I the asshole for telling my sister that a comment she made is exactly why her marriage crashed and burned? My sister has been staying with my husband and I, men in our late 20s, for the last week and some change. She and her husband have initiated the divorce process and she said she doesn't want to stay alone right now, which I completely understand. It would be very hard to go from living with a partner to a completely silent house. I opened our home to her before I found out why her marriage didn't work out. Now that the two of us have had multiple conversations about it, I'm a little uncomfortable. There was no infidelity. There was no big scandal. What she told me is that her husband wasn't having sex with her enough. The things she has been saying have floored me. She says without sex, the two of them were basically just like roommates. 
She said she had been pushing for him to get a hormone imbalance test done because while they were still having sex, it wasn't enough. She said he had begun resisting even normal touches from her because from his perspective, all she thought about was sex, which apparently isn't true. I'm not sure I believe that. I can elaborate in the comments, but overall, it just left me feeling sad for her ex and the disrespect of saying sex is the only thing that separates a partner from a roommate, not even a friend. I've done my best to be supportive, but I can't relate to the thought process at all. If my partner told me that he wasn't up for sex for the next few weeks, months, or longer, I would just take care of myself and respect that. I love him, and I want him to be the person I do life with forever. This all came to a head last night. My husband and I were having a typical lazy Saturday night, catching up on some shows, and chatting while we lounge on the couch. His legs were in my lap and I was kind of absent-mindedly massaging his feet and rubbing his ankles. This was an innocent gesture. My sister came in, saw me doing it, and made a joke along the lines of, Ah, OP, I didn't know you were into feet, or I didn't know you had a foot fetish. The exact wording escapes me. I couldn't help but feel put off at her sexualizing the gesture. Intimacy can be sexual, but it doesn't have to be. I told her so, and then said, referring to her divorce, you sexualizing every interaction is why you're in the situation you are now. She called me a dick and left the room. I already know that it was a little harsh, but I'm unsure if it was tough love or too much. Am I the asshole? Edit, I appreciate everyone's recommendation, but I do not like the dead bedroom subreddit. See my comment here where I elaborate on why. I did venture on that subreddit after I saw the term mentioned here a few times. Unfortunately, I was not very sympathetic to the rhetoric being presented there. One of the first posts I saw said, Which is worse, withholding sex from your partner or cheating? And someone responded by saying one causes the other, which should tell you which is the most severe. So, pretty disheartening to read that. I don't think I'll ever be able to fully understand the positions of the people there because I don't think not being in the mood is ever a punishment and I also think cheating is one of the most cowardly things that someone can do. I agree that lack of intimacy is a huge problem in a relationship but sex is not the only intimacy there is and it seems that so many sadly think otherwise. I'm not on the side of OP on this one. I think that what she was saying was a joke and she wasn't sexualizing the situation. I think you're just picking a fight, OP, and I think you're an asshole for doing that. Like, yes, inherently, the wording of the joke is sexualizing the interaction. But foot fetish, funny. I think you taking the wording literally and not for the joke that it was makes you an asshole and then turning that on her and her marriage took it up a notch where it didn't need to go. Is it so crazy that some people process hard times like this by making jokes of it, making light of the situation so that they can help move forward? I don't think it's so crazy, but I do think that you escalating the situation and taking it to a place that it didn't need to go to was crazy and I think you should apologize for that. I think you're the asshole. In the comments, Purple Dragon says, not the asshole. That is a weird thing to say to your sibling, and thinking every time you touch your partner it has to be for sexual reasons is screwed up. You probably could have been nicer, but that's a weird thing to say. It seemed like a joke. Could have been nicer? He told his sister that she deserved her life falling apart. I'm not sure he could have been much meaner. Did you miss the part of the post where OP says him and his husband are both men in their 20s? Lol. If it was said in a joking manner, I doubt the post would be here. Everyone sucks here. It's weird that your sister made a comment that sexualized her brother. That's effing strange. However, why did you have to bring her failed marriage into it? She confided in you, you didn't agree, and you threw it in her face. There are so many ways you could have expressed your concerns about her reasons for her divorce without attacking her. Honestly, the foot thing sounds like a joke and OP kind of sounds like a tight ass to begin with. OP kind of sounds like they're trying to justify having a low libido. High libido is fine, low libido is also fine. Matching libidos is really the key to a satisfying sex life in marriage. How is OP's sex life at all relevant? Wouldn't you also be annoyed if your partner never wanted to cuddle or be intimate without being sexual? Even as someone with a really high libido, I'd be so annoyed. My partner and I will lay like the grandparents in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and rub each other's feet while watching TV. 
It's not sexual at all, and that level of comfort and caring is really what makes a relationship different from friends and roommates in my opinion. OP's sister's inability to see that is exactly what ruined her marriage, and OP might be an asshole for saying it out loud, but he's not wrong. Well, we don't know that she never wanted intimacy without sex. We know that that's OP's assumption after a handful of conversations and one misguided joke. Since he doesn't have a shred of evidence that it's true, and not just what he thinks, it seems naive to completely write off the possibility that he's exaggerating to justify demonizing her high libido because they value sex differently in marriage. Info. Did she ever try to coerce her partner for more intimacy? Seems like we're missing some context if he started recoiling at her touch. That is a huge reaction that doesn't just pop out of nowhere. Honestly, sexual incompatibility happens in relationships. Sometimes one partner has a high libido, and the other has next to no libido. Neither are in the wrong, and both are valid reasons for ending the relationship. Your sister isn't in the wrong for just having a high sex drive. And OP replies, I don't think that there was any direct coercion, at least from what she's told me. She said that she was feeling very rejected because she was trying to initiate a lot, and he wasn't receptive except for about once a week, and that she would drop it without pressuring him after he gave non-verbal, I'm not into it cues, or said no. However, I do find the line between coercion and expressing desires to be particularly fine in situations like these. In my past experiences with breakups, there were usually multiple conversations leading up to the main event that took place. How do you properly initiate a conversation where the main takeaway is, if you don't start sleeping with me X times a week, I'm leaving, without it sounding at least a little bit like coercion? I don't know. I think that I would be more forgiving if this was a dating breakup and not a marriage one, since these problems have occurred their entire relationship past the first few months apparently. Edit, change some wording to clarify the two of them were seemingly having sex about once a week. I had unintentionally made it sound like he was always turning her down, which isn't the case from what I've been told. I think you're being unfair to your sister and that you're making a lot of assumptions. Why do you assume the conversation went, if you don't have X amount of sex with me, I'm leaving, when it could have gone, I'm not feeling loved or valued in this relationship because our physical intimacy isn't at a place that makes me feel loved or valued, is there something that we can do about this? You could even flip it if we wanted to, with equally unfair assumptions. Isn't it coercion to tell your partner that you'll work on being more physically intimate when you don't intend to, just to keep them in the marriage? How do we know that he wasn't just constantly promising to do more and never following through? Unfair assumptions swing both ways, which is why judging others based on them hurts everyone involved. Posted by a throwaway account titled... Am I the asshole for forcing my stepdaughter to pay me back after she ruined my house? I, 43 female, and my husband, 47 male, have been married for 4 years now. We both have children from our previous marriages, 12 male and 10 male, and O, 18 female. My husband and I dated for 3 years prior to getting married, but moved in all together 2 years ago. O lives with us full time, and we had a bit of a rocky start with mine and O's relationship, but we managed to push through it. I told O from day one that I wasn't her mum, but if there was anything that she wants to talk about or needs, she can come to me. After a few months, we became quite close, and she talked to me about anything she was too embarrassed to talk about with her dad. Recently, O has been trying to make friends at college since she just started in the spring, on-campus residence is very expensive for the college, and it's close to our house, so O decided to stay at home. That's not a problem. The problem is that O keeps bringing her friends over to hang out, but leaving it a mess. Normally, it's not a major deal. I have OCD, so sometimes there is issues depending on the situation though, because she picks up after herself. But I recently hired a housekeeper to clean the house once a week, since I've been working overtime more often, and me and my husband just don't have time. It's expensive, but I cannot stand it when it becomes too messy for me, so I think it's worth it. This time she brought her friends over after the house was cleaned, and I guess they decided not to take their shoes off, and walked all around the house leaving footprints. They also made pizza from scratch, and left the crumbles on the counters, among other things. They pretty much made the entire house filthy before I could even come home. Once again, the cleaning service is quite expensive because I like a higher level of cleaning quality, so I was pissed. 
My husband is trying to make me let it go because O has always struggled making friends, but I can't let it go because of how much it cost. I requested the exact amount I paid for the cleaning service to her Venmo, and she acted all confused on why she had to pay for it. I explained that her and her friends ruined my house that was just cleaned, but she insisted that it wasn't. I have a ring camera, and I have video proof of her and her friends going into the house, and they were the only ones home that day before me. I gave her two choices, pay for the damages, or I stop paying for her phone. She's complaining, saying that it wasn't her, and she doesn't have the money to pay the phone bill. Am I the asshole? Edit to clear confusion, the cleaners came before O, fully cleaned the house, and then left, and an hour later, O came in with her friends. OP, I can somewhat see where you're coming from, but I honestly think that you're overreacting. I promise you, my opinion here is not detracting at all from the OCD, I'm very much aware that you have that, as you stated. But it's not like they went full on cat in the hat and started just absolutely tearing apart the house. That, I would be on your side with. You are framing this the wrong way, you're framing it as though they went full on cat in the hat and destroyed the house. I think this situation would be reasonable if you told her just to clean up after herself and her friends, not demand that she pay you back for this. I feel like that's ludicrous. So I feel like you're overreacting and you're the asshole in this situation. In the comments, 12 days late says, Footprints in your house and pizza crumbs do not make a house filthy. You had plenty of other options than charging your daughter. You could have cleaned it, your husband could have, you could have asked her to clean it, etc. You're the asshole. Telling your daughter that she ruined your house is a surefire way to ruin your relationship with her. Yeah, this is outrageously unreasonable. I have OCD. I'm genuinely baffled that OP felt that it was anything other than manipulative to refer to footprints and crumbs as damage. I thought this was going to be about some house party where furniture was destroyed and items were stolen. OP should consider therapy. This is some monk-level insanity. I'm with you. I was waiting for the, they made pizza but then went outside drinking and the kitchen caught on fire and it'll cause $30,000 to fix. Crumbs? As in wipeable off-the-counter crumbs? I'm with you. She needs therapy and ASAP. This is an unlivable situation for everyone. I literally had to go back after I first read the post because I was like, wait, what am I missing here? I always ask people to remove their shoes before entering my house if they don't mind. Never for a delivery guy or anything like that. I'm not a monster. <laughs> and lots of people prefer not to, so I get that. But there is yet to be a shoe print that my Swiffer or vacuum couldn't erase in seconds. And I'm still laughing every time I see the word crumbs mentioned on here. Like, how is this even something that someone is legitimately upset about? Mr. Nathan Pride asks, Info. I understand that you have OCD, not judging you for that. However, wouldn't a better solution be have O clean up the mess? It was footprints and crumbs. Seems like an easy clean. And OP replies, I do agree that would have been better, but O doesn't have the same level of cleaning level of the cleaning service, so I would most likely have to redo it until it's finally clean for my liking. It sounds like your cleanliness standards are extreme. Are you seeking help for your OCD? OP replies, I am. It has been helping, but I definitely still need more time to fully figure out how to manage it. Well, I'm glad to hear that you're getting help, but sending your stepdaughter a Venmo bill is not an appropriate way to handle this. Your OCD is not your fault, and I'm sorry you're going through this. But I promise you, you are going to do harm to your relationship with O if you keep behaving this way. Footprints and some crumbs shouldn't take more than 5 to 10 minutes to clean up. It isn't her fault, but it is her responsibility to manage and not take out on other people. It can be crippling. One of my kids wanted to burn himself when he saw hot things. He also has OCD. It was terrifying when he told me. I don't think that she is taking any responsibility for her OCD. Here are some other comments from OP. I'm not usually the one to discipline her because I'm not her mum, and I think that would be crossing a bit of a boundary with her dad and me. She probably didn't expect a potential consequence because of my lack of discipline with her. I think visible shoe prints are filthy, which is why there is a no shoes in the house rule put into place that I set up when we first all moved in together. Also, it's considered very rude in my country to walk around someone else's house with shoes. I do understand that she's a teenager, but she is 18 and is a legal adult, so I treat her like one. 
I should have clarified this, but I did put a rule that people can't wear shoes in the house because it's so unsanitary and there's 10 times more cleaning when there's outside shoes inside. I was raised with very strict cleaning standards, so in my books, crumbs and visible footprints are filthy to me. The whole reason I pay for the cleaning service is because I've been spending more time at work and my husband has a long work schedule, so we don't have any time to do the cleaning ourselves. It's considered very, very rude in my country to walk around someone else's house with their shoes on and it was snowing that day, so water stains were left where they stepped. After reading these comments, I do realize my standards may have been put too high, but cleaning up after yourself isn't anything new in our house, and everybody is expected to do their share as well as any messes they make themselves. I couldn't even see the house I paid money to be cleaned before it was already dirty though. And now onto the update. As I write this, I'm still getting comments on the original post. Thank you for all those who have commented, but I do want to ask that some users please tone down things that they're saying about myself and my OCD. I don't appreciate people trying to say that I'm financially abusing my stepdaughter. I understand that most are upset at me, but please don't comment that I should be institutionalized because I've been getting comments and messages along those lines. This morning, I asked Olivia to have a sit down with me and to fully discuss how we both felt about my reaction as well as how we are still feeling. Olivia was quite upset at me because she's been trying so hard to make friends and she feels like I'm trying to discourage her from making them. We also talked about the house and the bill situation. I told her that I apologize. I overreacted and I said things in the heat of the moment, but I would like her to clean up after herself in the future. She doesn't have to cover the cleaning bill and I will continue to pay for her phone bill. As for my OCD, many of you felt the need to tell me that I am terrorizing my entire household and should pay for therapy instead of a cleaning service. I've been getting help for my OCD, but this situation made me realize I need to work more on it and managing it. I have also been getting comments that my stress may be caused by working overtime and I've put a request in for fewer hours as well as I've been looking for a possible vacation for all five of us since a few suggested that that may help. In the comments, Aves Thasnos Sleeve says, I don't know. While OP may have impossible standards, Olivia still needs to step up and clean up after herself and her friends and reinforce the no shoes rule. I can't really see that anyone is horrible here. And while OP is taking steps to work on her OCD, I sure didn't see Olivia own up to anything. But I doubt this is household warring worthy. I can see how, if you are an average teenage messiness and an adult comes in and says that even the most minor crumbs is completely filthy and probably has an excessive reaction, then you just might develop a screw it, why even bother attitude. Well, this can happen for sure. My dad's ex-girlfriend, who he dated for a few years, lived with us and was absolutely militant about cleaning. She once had a meltdown because my sister and I cleaned the kitchen but left one dirty spoon in the sink. Sometimes my sister wouldn't bother with any of her chores if she only had time for one third because she would get yelled at either way. This all hinges on what the mess was. Mud tracked everywhere and food strewn all over the kitchen? I'd be on OP's side, at least for personal responsibility and cleaning up your own mess. A few scuffs on the floor and crumbs on the counter? That's normal home use, and you can't hermetically seal your home between cleanings. I could see it being either way, plus a hearty F you to everyone making light of OCD or treating it as lock her up and throw away the key material. As a Canadian, the wearing of outdoor shoes inside the house just blows my mind. I would have lost it too. I'm Canadian engaged to a Texan. Over the winter, we got into a heated fight because I kept telling him to take his shoes off. Stepping in a puddle in hosiery when you're in a hurry is a morning ruiner. He's sweet though and tries hard. Don't you just love it when a random group of anonymous internet strangers decide to dogpile on one woman who has come to air her grievances and say, hey, uh, help me out please, what's going on? And those internet strangers go, you have OCD, you need to be institutionalized. Why do people feel the need to say that? Like, my comment on the OCD was, I understand that and I respect that you do have OCD. I don't want to step over any boundaries here. I guess I may have been harsh with my critique before. But those people that said that, screw those people. Although it is very mature and very respectful of OP to have crossed that bridge with Olivia, communicated, and it's great that they're starting to mend their relationship and figure this all out. 
Anyway guys, what did you think of this one down in the comments below? I'd love to know your opinions. Our next post is by user ThrowAwayInsane, titled, My wife won't let my dad hold my son when he is born, and the situation is getting worse. So me and my wife have been arguing over the past few days over who does and doesn't get to hold the baby when it's first born. Recently, my father and sister have been added to the list of who cannot. I have been disagreeing with the desire that my father can hold the baby within the first few hours, but she stands firm with her choice to keep him from doing so, and she now has her parents on her side. Her reasons are that it's for the baby's health, which I get, however, part of the reason is that my father is too weird and that he is dirty. I find this incredibly rude, and if I were to put myself in my father's shoes, I would want to hold my first grandson. Regardless of these reasons, her and my in-laws agree that my father and sister will not touch the baby until a few months later, and that I should agree and stop being stupid. In my gut, I feel it's wrong and unfair when my in-laws will be one of the first to hold my son. I'm the one who carries it. It's my choice, she excuses herself with, limiting the rights that I have as a father. My mother-in-law snapped at me, saying that I will never be able to see the child if we get a divorce and that she will fight for it if this continues. Even my wife has agreed that if I don't tell my father that he cannot hold my son the day of his birth, she will refuse to let me know when the time comes if I am at work. This destroyed me. All I wished for was an amount of fairness, as I should exercise my right as a soon-to-be dad. I have been called immature, rude, and selfish because of this entire ordeal, and I just don't understand. I respect my wife and her choices, but I feel like there is a lack of respect for not only me, but also my father. Am I wrong? Edit, my dad has asked her for a picture of the ultrasound, and she refuses to let him see it. I'm at the end of my rope with her. In the comments, Lynn says, What the hell? This sounds like you and your wife need counselling. Badly. The problems you have now are going to get 1,000 times worse when you have a baby. Yup, babies magnify whatever environment they are born into. And the mother-in-law sounds batshit effing crazy. Where did the divorce talk come from? If you feel that you and your wife are in a good place, it means the mother-in-law has been pushing towards our... or kicking you out, I don't know... If you are not in a good place with the missus, then your wife has been talking about it with her mum and she let it slip. Look, I'm not trying to spread paranoia, but my buddy just got blindsided by this postpartum depression slash bipolar wife whose mother had been talking crap about my buddy for years. It might be nothing, but seriously, just pay attention. Good luck. Unless your father has an incurable, fairly easy transmittable disease, there is no risk to your baby. Your wife and her parents sound like the sick, dirty people, in my opinion. If they are already threatening to dissolve the marriage and take the kid unless you give in to their insane demands, then you've already lost. I'd head over to r slash legal advice. OP replies, His house is cluttered, but he certainly does not have anything comparable to rabies or HIV. He's a clean guy. Ellen M 83 says, I'm working on the premise that before the pregnancy, your wife wasn't a cruel, controlling hag. If she was a bridezilla prior to this, you're on your own. Either the protective hormones are clouding her judgement, or her own parents are trying to keep her and the baby while excluding you from the picture. Listen to yourself. You're asking if you're wrong while your mother-in-law is threatening you with divorce and keeping your child away from you. Your in-laws have absolutely no place in all of this. Get these people out of your house, get your wife to a therapist, and deal with this now before the baby is born. Your wife is being alienated from your family. The next step will be distancing her from you. You need to get your wife into therapy immediately. There is a disgusting power play going on here. Sit her down and demand to know what is going on. And now on to the update. So I decided to put my foot down and allow my dad to see a picture of the ultrasound. And my wife went batshit crazy. She started shaking and pleading with me not to send him a photo. I refused and tried to state my reasons that I had a right and so did he. I was close to taking the picture when my wife starts to punch me in the back and grabbing my arm to take the photos away, calling her mum in the process. She puts it on speaker and my mother-in-law orders me to respect her wishes and that if I don't, she can get me in legal trouble and jailed. 
It finally got out that my wife hates my father because of the things he did to me when I was little. I was abused as a child, and that he is too weird for her to associate with. I refused to give in, and politely told her that my father had rights to see the ultrasound, and that she, the mother-in-law, did not need to be a part of the argument. I get an earful from the both of them, stating that it is her body and she calls the shots. All I did was provide the sperm and I do nothing for the baby. I continue to try, but my wife won't let go of my arm and calling me names that I break down and I slam the pictures on the desk, saying a few choice words, which was stupid on my part, and leaving to cool off outside. I come back in and she's telling me that she wants a divorce and that it's no longer my problem, that I won't be coming to the hospital and seeing the baby. Her father is also reasoning with my wife, saying that every ultrasound is the same, you see one and you've seen it all, and that I'm not respecting her nor the baby. They want me to give in and let her have her way. I'm sitting in an empty room now, devoid of all of her belongings, and thinking dark thoughts that I can't shake. I don't think there is any way to mend this problem, as she refuses counselling because she doesn't want to talk about her problems to a stranger, and giving up entirely. Something I don't want to do is the only way. Edit. The details concerning my father and his abuse towards me was that he, and my mother who is not alive anymore, were physical and emotionally abusive for almost seven years of my life. It reached the point where they got a divorce, and in order for him to see us, he had to go through counselling and major anger management therapy. It stopped after that, and to this day he has shown no signs of abusive behaviour. He's a changed man, but I wouldn't let him take care of my son for longer than a day. However, I still believe a relationship with my child and his grandfather is necessary. In the comments, Aromatic says, Can't tell if the wife is unhinged in suffering some kind of major PPA, the husband is delusional and his father has done something truly heinous to elicit this behavior, or possibly both. Either way, there are some real red flags in this situation, and I feel incredibly sorry for the baby. Honestly, reading this story bummed me the hell out because that innocent little bean is going to come into some real chaos in the world. Once again, holy crap, do people even talk about stuff before marriage or before the baby arrives? Granted, we don't know all the facts in this OP's posts, but just in general, it feels like so many couples I've known just think they can wing it without any talks about deep stuff. My fiancé's mother is absolutely horrible. She's been emotionally abusive towards him his whole life, nonchalantly tells him that she'd have had an abortion if she'd found out she was pregnant with him sooner, and is currently in a relationship with a sex offender who videoed a 16-year-old in the bath, which he got done for, and also most likely my fiancé's sister, and possibly me. Oh, oh god, I hate that. We don't really talk to her, and we've had lengthy conversations about her not having any sort of contact with any potential children that we may have. Maid Assassin says, This was not the way to confront someone who suffered abuse. She wanted to keep his abusive father away so badly that she resorted to physical abuse? I'm at a loss here. The minute she put her hands on him, her parents should have intervened on his behalf. He needs help, and she needs to keep her hands to herself. You can't tell your spouse that your father should be kept away due to physical abuse when your response is to punch them. What the hell? Yeah, I don't like your father because he abused you, so let me slap you and threaten divorce now so you understand, is some unhinged behavior. Let's call it like it is. That is abusive behavior. I've been in this situation before. I grew up in a home where my stepdad would beat me and my mom, so I've always had a hard line on domestic violence. The day I left my now ex-wife, she kicked me in the chest, threw a whole ass baby gate at me, etc. This was over my line. I grabbed my keys and shoes, shaking, and drove to a nearby park and called her parents, who up to that point, loved me. I let them know that she got physical with me, and somebody needed to come get her. First thing her mum did was accuse me of being the abuser, which, given my history, I lost it at the audacity of this woman. Narcissists that raise narcissists will never take the morally correct side against their child, it's an omission of guilt that their kid is the problem, and that's not a thing that they can reconcile. Well, that was really messy, but uh, I don't know what to say about this. I feel like there was a lot of context missing in this situation. It did honestly feel very one-sided from the OP's perspective, 
And I would have loved to get some more history and sides to what is going on with that basket case of a dumpster fire. I digress. I would love to know what you guys think of this one down in the comments below. Let me know. Our next post is by user Extension Marzipan 86 titled, Am I the asshole for my husband missing his daughter's prom? I, 36 female, have been married to my husband Josh, 40, for 10 years. We have a 9-year-old daughter Lauren together, and my stepdaughter Riley is 18. About a year ago, I booked a vacation with my girlfriends for one of their bachelorette parties. It's this weekend in Tennessee. We leave Thursday and come back Monday. This weekend, Lauren has a cheerleading competition that Josh is taking her to. Lauren is required to have a guardian there the whole time, and she needs to arrive early Friday and leaving Sunday. We did ask the cheer director if a friend's mum could bring her and my husband could meet her thereafter, but they said no, and if she's not there for the check-in time, she can't compete that weekend. Riley's prom is on Friday. Riley did not have a junior prom, and her school only has a senior prom. We found out the day to prom after school started, and the trip had already been booked and paid for. My husband is now going to be missing Riley's prom to take Lauren to her competition. Riley thinks this is extremely unfair and that we're playing favorites since she'll never get this chance again and she wants pictures with her dad and sister. She's been messaging my husband about it. Lauren doesn't want to miss her competition and risk her spot on her team. My husband asked if I'd cancel my trip and I told him no. The trip has been booked, paid for, and I also need a break. He takes breaks and trips as well. My husband and I are now fighting because he feels like no matter what he does, he's stuck. He's already told Lauren that he'll be taking her to the cheer comp, which means that he'll be missing prom. So am I the asshole? OP has offered the following explanation for why they think they might be the asshole. I feel like I'm the asshole for not cancelling my trip when both girls have important events this weekend. I'm just going to swing out the gates and say no assholes here. I don't really think that anyone can be blamed for their actions here. Though you have pre-planned commitments that you can't cancel on, he already promised Lauren that he would help her out. As unfortunate as it is that Riley won't be able to get photos with everyone, that's just how life works out sometimes unfortunately, and you're not a bad person for sticking to your guns in this instance. So yeah, I guess my judgement is no assholes here. In the comments, Brewerton Fat says, No assholes here. Whomever is organising the cheerleader competition is the asshole. There is no reason they should restrict another member of the family from bringing her or simply allowing her to go with another parent and a permission slip. I don't think it has anything to do with the competition itself, but the coach slash team. But yes, they are the asshole. Being devil's advocate, maybe the coach and team have had this before and something happened, which is why the answer is no to another parent taking the child. I'd guess it's the insurance liability. If a child gets hurt, they need someone who can make medical decisions. Competitive cheer looks dangerous. I'm just speculating though. No assholes here. I hope Riley has an otherwise good relationship with her dad and Lauren. She will eventually understand, in my honest opinion. Yeah, this is 100% safeguarding, and cheer has had issues similar to gymnastics, abuse of minors by coaches. Mandating parental and legal guardian attendance has become really common in traveling for competitions for kids. Sadly, if they're competitive to a high level, that travel is constant. It's genuinely a selecting factor redevelopment of competitive athletes. They have to have parents who can afford to travel frequently. Generally, that's easiest for wealthy, non-blended families with a stay-at-home parent. No assholes here, but poor Riley. It's understandable that she feels upset, even if it isn't anyone's fault but bad timing. I'd take care if I were her dad to jump some hoops to make it up to her, though can tell you from personal experience that the feeling of abandonment when your parent chooses their younger half-sibling over them is real and you don't forget it easily. Nor is it something that can be reasoned with often. It leads to long-running resentment. Right? So basically, we're restricting certain sports to families wealthy enough and stable enough for one parent to be available all the time. So like, no one where one parent works shift work, has two kids, or doesn't have enough money to drop work at a moment's notice. That's seriously effed up. Madtown Mitch says, You're the asshole, as is your husband. Prom happens once. Your nine-year-old has plenty of cheerleading competitions. The focus should be the once-in-a-lifetime deal. No wonder your stepdaughter is totally pissed. 
do better. Added to add, I'm a divorce attorney and former therapist. I know and deal with these dynamics on the daily. Riley is obviously upset, or the stepmom would not have posted. Note that Riley appears to have gone through her parents' divorce at about the same age as her stepsister is now, maybe a bit younger. Many communities and cultures have a significant tradition of parental involvement in prom, even if it is just photos. If anyone thinks this is the first time Riley felt replaced or cast aside by dad and stepmom, you are not living in reality. It's not the actual act of the photos and prom that is the issue, it is the symbolism and very real pain of an 18-year-old girl. This is a wild take. Prom happens once. It doesn't. She's not missing prom. He's missing a two-minute photo op before prom for pictures that will almost never be looked at again. Most of the people at my prom couldn't wait to get away from their parents and on with the night. In fact, pictures will still be taken. He's not giving her away at a wedding. There is no father-daughter aspect to a prom. That is barely a blip on the radar of what prom itself is, let alone the rest of one's life, and she will even have one parent there. People here are acting like it's a wedding that he's missing. Riley will be absolutely fine. She's just not getting her way and making a big deal about something that is barely an issue. If dad had to work, would she be upset about him not being there? And now, onto the update. I have decided to stand my ground that I will not be cancelling my trip. I will be getting on the plane in the morning. Josh just sat me down with Riley and Lauren to talk about the weekend. He explained he'll be taking Lauren to her competition while Riley's mother takes pictures with her at prom. He said he taught the girls about commitment and he's not going to have Lauren's absence have the team forfeit. He told her that we could do pictures if she wanted to put her dress on a second time, but she said that it won't be the same and that she's upset. Riley's upset with her father and thinks he's favoring Lauren. Posted by user Revenant Rising, titled, Am I the asshole for telling my parents that if they won't tell me the truth, I will assume the worst of them? So, my 14 female family totally exploded while I was on spring break two weeks ago. I went on a trip with my grandparents and came back to my mum moved out and a serious sit down about them divorcing. It's not exactly a surprise because they've both been acting weird and shady for a while, but like, that's not what I was expecting to come back to and they could have let me unpack first at least. They asked me if I had any questions and I asked them which one cheated because that was my first thought. They got super uncomfortable and said that the reasons between them were private. I said not when it means that I suddenly lost my family over it and they owe me at least some reason that this is happening and we don't love each other anymore doesn't cut it. You don't just stop loving someone for no reason. That's dumb. So what? They said that was all I needed to know and that we need to talk about how the living situation was going to work and everything. I told them that I don't want to live with either of them if they're going to be like that. Everyone has been mad since then and my mum came over to talk it out last night. They still don't want to tell me why. I told them both that if they were going to hide stuff, I'll just make up my own worst case and go with that. Since mum left, it can be all her fault and since it's her fault, I won't live with her or go to see her. She got upset and said that was unfair and that it wasn't her fault. I told her to give me the real reason then or to just deal with it. My dad said that I was out of line and I said it can all be his fault then and same deal. That started an argument between the two of them but I'm holding my own. Pretty sure at least one of them will crack and tell me what happens soon so I can decide how I feel about it. I don't need like graphic details, but a simple, someone cheated, or mum is a secret lesbian don't tell anyone, or we've both really changed a lot and don't want the same things, would help. If one of them did something bad, I want to know. If they won't own up or explain why there are no bad guys, they can both be the bad guy. I had to talk to my school counsellor today, and she said that it's totally understandable, but playing them against each other is going to hurt everyone. So... Am I the asshole? Of course, I have already read this story previously, but there has been so much new content, I am covering it again. You guys have already heard my thoughts on this situation previously. This is a tumultuous situation. Yes, it's hard to break news like this to a kid. Sometimes it's better to just break the seal and let them know outright what the situation is, and they can develop their own thoughts and feelings on that. Sometimes it's best to keep it to yourself and maintain the peace. In the comments, 
You're the asshole, but you're clearly just a kid who desperately needs therapy to process and understand this and navigate what it means. Your parents are doing a great job handling the divorce so far, so I hope they continue to do great and get you into therapy ASAP. If they're on top of things, they were looking into this before they even announced their divorce. OP replies, We already have to go see someone altogether this week, and I told them that I'm not saying anything to the counsellor because I didn't mess this up. They did. So they need counselling, not me. I don't have any other questions. If they can't answer this one, then I can't trust either of them, so nothing else matters. I don't want a relationship with them if one of them did something bad to the other. If they both caused it, I want to go live with my grandma instead of either of them. Can't trust people that act shady and hide important things. I'm 10,000% cool with torching relationships with people who lie and hide things from me. If my mom is a lesbian, that's completely fair. I'd want to know why she stayed married for like 20 years, but like, that's not anyone's fault. If my dad fell out of love with my mom, I would want to know why. Yeah, I'm gonna have some side eye for that because it's a little bit of a douchebag move after wasting like 20 years of someone's life and getting me mixed up in it, but as long as he hasn't been running around with other people behind her back, that's like, not like, unreasonable. I'm not going to be happy with either of them now anyway because I know they're hiding something and that's not okay. Even if it's nobody's fault, they could have said that instead of not answering. The only reason to hide it is if there is something worth hiding. If I'm going to go through the suck no matter what, I'm taking them with me. If they gave me some indication of why they fell out of love, sure. We fell out of love because we're super different now than when we got married. We fell out of love because we have really different values and can't agree. We fell out of love because we really just hate living together. We fell out of love because we hurt one another too bad to keep going. All those would be fine. I'm not stupid because I'm 14. There is always a reason that people stop liking each other, even if it's a dumb, it's a reason. I don't have to know everything, but I need a general direction. If my dad really hurt my mum enough to make her have to leave, I will eat him alive. If my mum hurt my dad enough to kick her out, big same. If it's just normal bullshit, then they can tell me that, and leave me out of it, and I'll figure out what I want to do later. Just on what I've found, they've planned the move for more than a month. This wasn't a last minute thing. My mum's apartment was rented three months ago. I have the entire email chain about it between her and her new landlord, and another set of DMs about it between her and her parents setting up the trip to get me out of town for the move. My grandparents also lied for the entire trip to keep up the lie. My dad has lied to his job on multiple occasions, and I have the Expedia receipts and texts to prove it. Also looking very much like they are both cheaters. I'm just researching the timeline and partners now, and finding additional supporting evidence so they can't claim that it's not true. Right now, they can come clean that they both effed up massively, and we can figure it out if I can trust them again, or good riddance to the trash. Back up to the post, we have an edit. Okay, I'm the asshole. That's okay. I did some digging on my own tonight, and I know pretty much what happened now. I don't feel bad about being an asshole to assholes. Thanks. Edit number two, people keep asking me what happened. My mom is stalking her boyfriend and his wife and trying to break up their marriage. My dad is screwing one of his 17-year-old athletes and other people. I got the receipts and got the help to report the 17-year-old thing because that is not even remotely okay. It crashed and burned on him on Friday and I haven't heard from him since then. I worked out stuff with my grandparents and they believe me that my mum is lying to them. I'm living with them right now and they're figuring things out with my other grandma to make a permanent plan. My mum is mad that I wouldn't go to her place after the blow up but I've already told her that I don't want to talk to her for a while. The cop said that I could stay where I am at the moment. That's where we are now. It sucks, but it would be worse if I didn't know and had to keep on living with them with all this crap going on. I'm glad I didn't listen to some people here and just let it drop. I'm glad to know that all the weird stuff I've noticed over the last year was real and not made up like my parents told me. I'm glad my dad isn't going to be able to be gross towards his players anymore. I'm okay being the asshole here just for that reason alone. And now onto the update. Updates and thoughts. This is more of an exercise for me so that I can get my thoughts straight before I make some decisions. If you're here to yell at me about being an asshole from my Am I the Asshole post, today is not the day and I am not the one. 
I accept the judgment, I just don't feel bad about it now. If you can be cool with your feedback, I'm open to that. I do listen and turn over reasonable advice, but I've had a stressful week, so constructive replies only, please. I won't be humoring aggressive trolls. To bring everything up to date, 1. Family therapy was a fiasco. I told the counselor that I didn't want to participate and I would rather stay in the lobby. After she tried to convince me to stay in the room, she let me go back out. My parents told me that I was grounded if I didn't stay. The therapist talked to them alone for a while and then we left. I am not grounded, they are big mad. I still have to go with them weekly, but I don't have to stay in the room. I have to go to an individual counselor next week and I'll see what happens when I refuse treatment. Hopefully I won't have to go back. 2. I've decided to keep the contents of the dossier I gathered closed for now until I can weigh a couple of points of moral conflict. There are illegal things going on, but busting it open could hurt people who don't deserve it. It might keep some other people from getting hurt though. Depending on how my parents react, there is a not zero chance it could get me physically hurt unless I can do it in a way to be out of reach. I want to have private, in-person conversations with all my grandparents and maybe my rabbi first. 3. My mum cracked last night like I thought she would, but only admitted to my dad cheating. I am so done with the both of them. 4. I was going to spend a month with each set of grandparents this summer anyways, so my parents agreed to just let my home base be with my grandma until the fall. I'll go once my exams are done. At least my grandma is happy. And 5. I talked to my other grandparents after Shabbat dinner and told them that I know they lied to me. They apologized and we talked. I'm sleeping over with them this weekend and we'll hash some things out tomorrow. I feel like something I've learned this week is that some people really get mad when I resist being controlled. Being a good kid and doing what everyone has told me are the right things doesn't matter unless I shut up and do what I'm told. I'm not going to stop doing good, but I feel pretty done with shutting up and obeying. A lot of people said that I would regret knowing the truth. I don't. Happy isn't the word. I'm tired and really disappointed and angry. Now I know who I'm dealing with and I feel better knowing that I wasn't imagining things like my parents said. In the comments, Coven Supreme says, I just had to comment here. Reading your post was like reading how I was at the age of 14. Very stubborn, very concerned with right and wrong, and filled with rage. But you're allowed to be filled with rage, because I can't imagine coming home at that age and hearing that. I'm so sorry, OP. I want to know though, how was your relationship with your parents prior to all of this? It seems like you were very adamant about your harsh, sorry I can't find another word but know that I'm not condemning you in the slightest, behavior towards them, which makes me think that you never trusted them. Or maybe you're just acting like this now because you were very confused about the situation. You said something illegal is going on and you don't want to bust it open because it gets other people hurt, but it also may prevent someone from hurting others. This is going to be a really awkward question, but did one of your parents cheat on the other with someone who wasn't of legal age? Because that's the only thing that comes to mind. You don't even have to answer if you don't want to, but that just seemed concerning to read. Edit, I read all of your comments and my suspicion was proved right, but I also learned other things. I'm so sorry. And OP replies, I haven't trusted my parents for a while. Looking back, I don't think I fully trusted them for way longer than before I started noticing the really weird behavior. In the last couple of years, I just didn't realize that's why I felt weird about them. They don't get me. It has just gotten worse over time. With how they handled all this, it's like they don't know anything about me. I loved my parents, I just didn't like them very much. Now I don't love them either. I don't want to get into the illegal stuff just in case, but this is life ruining go to jail for years stuff for my dad and my mom is not far behind with what she's doing. There is at least one underage person involved, I'll say that. My mom's stuff seems to be escalating, so I'm worried that if it doesn't go the way that she wants, she might end up doing something even worse. And now onto the r slash legal advice post, titled, Legal question about anonymously reporting a crime. For the record, I'm under 18, so I'm sure that affects what I can and can't do here. This is something that needs to be handled by grown-ups, but I would be reporting on a family member, so I need to protect myself from the fallout. A close adult family member is having sex with a minor. Not like a few years age difference thing, like decades. 
I know the right thing to do would be to report it, but I need to do it anonymously. I found out from texts that I have screenshots of. Is there a way that I can get the information to the appropriate authorities without being identified? Would they even do anything with anonymously sent screenshots? How likely is it to be tracked back to me once it's in the open? Thanks in advance. Edit. The minor is 17 and this is in Oregon. The older person is the 17-year-old's coach. In the comments, Diablo Conqueso says, Location is critical, as are the ages of people involved. In many states in the USA, the age of consent is as low as 16 years old, meaning a 16-year-old can have sex with anyone else, or older, or a little older, or much older, legally. In other words, if the minor is at or over the age of consent, it doesn't matter how big the age gap is. OP replies, Oregon. The people involved are 17 and 43. 43 is the 17-year-old's coach. Diablo replies, Oregon's age of consent is 18, meaning the sexual relationship wouldn't be legal in the first place, but the fact that the older adult is their coach probably makes it even worse. Law enforcement is who to contact about this. There is no guarantee of anonymity. While you can request that when you report it, and law enforcement would likely respect that, there are a ton of ways that someone can infer or merely guess at who reported something. How likely it is that this minor and or this adult could guess that it was you is unknown. Though I'm not sure that you should let that dissuade you. And OP replies, Okay, thanks. I guess I was hoping that I could just get a burner and send an anonymous tip or something. It's going to get rough if they figure out that it was me. I don't think that they would be able to get that just from the screenshots. I'm more worried about the cops telling someone. If it has to happen that way, I guess that's what happens. And now, on to the final update. Things blew up this weekend. I wasn't home when everything happened, so I missed most of the fireworks, but I've gotten the story through family. My dad got suspended from his job Friday. The cops took him in. He's out now, but my grandparents told me that it's serious. Everyone in the family is all riled up, mostly at my dad. Apparently the word got out since he's a teacher and a coach, so it's a circus. My mom showed up to tell me what happened and to take me to her place, but I told her that I didn't want to go. My grandparents talked her down, so I'm staying with them. I go to a different school, but they decided to keep me home today. I'm supposed to talk with some people later this morning anyway and go get some clothes and stuff from the house. I haven't heard from my dad. My other grandma, his mom, came over yesterday, and I feel really bad for her. This is the saddest I've seen her since grandpa died. No one seems to know that I reported it. I don't know what happened with the girl, but I'm guessing she admitted stuff was happening. I hope she's okay. I don't know where things go from here, but I've told all my grandparents that I don't want to live with mom. Living with dad doesn't seem like an option right now, but I don't want to go there either. They said we would figure it out. I told my grandparents, mum's parents, last weekend that I don't think she's being honest with them, and they believe me. The cop I talked to said that as long as I'm in a safe place with people who are looking out for me, it's not likely that anyone is going to make me go back to my parents without a lot of legal wrangling, so as long as my grandparents are okay with it, I should be okay. I've got a summer job in the works, so I'm just going to focus on that and lay low I think. Save up everything I can. This whole thing is a mess, and I feel like I'm stuck in a nightmare a lot of the time, but I'm not sorry that I found out the truth. In the comments, Red Phantom says, Parents, they F you up. Penguin Joy replies, Poor OP has been lied to and gaslit so much that she has huge issues with trust. I don't blame her for digging deeper and finding the facts about what happened. Probably why she doesn't want to see a therapist. Talking to a therapist about how you feel takes a certain level of trust, and her parents have severely damaged their child's ability to do that. They don't deserve to be called parents. I never once thought that OP was the asshole in that whole situation. Hopefully she'll be able to heal on her own the further she is away from them. I remember reading her original post. I know the parents are usually told that it is not helpful or good for their children to know if they are divorcing because of infidelity or for one parent to lay blame on the other, so as a general rule, her parents are doing what they should have done in refusing to explain the details to their daughter. I think I commented to gently say something along those lines, and I'm pretty sure I also apologized for the fact that some of the comments were just awful and cruel. I also seem to recall saying that I agreed her parents were being unreasonable in refusing to give her any answers regarding the reason for their divorce. 
She gave them the opportunity to say something like they had just grown apart, etc., but they wouldn't even give her that. And that, quite reasonably, increased her suspicions. I definitely remember feeling bad for her, and now I feel just terrible for her. Jeez, the poor kid. However, given what OP discovered, especially about her father and his students, I have to say that, in the end, she was right to not let things lie, and I was wrong to say otherwise. Both of her parents are clearly complete messes, and, given their behavior, she's almost certainly better off living with her grandmother slash grandparents. Also, I'm really glad that she's got such a good rabbi and that she feels that she can trust him. She also revealed in subsequent posts about years of shady behavior that led up to the divorce, so it's not like everything went from fine to exploded over the course of a weekend. She'd already learned to distrust her parents and this whole situation just solidified that. Those details weren't initially included, but they didn't have to be for folks to not be effing assholes to a child trying to figure out what the hell was going on with the two people who she should be able to trust and rely on. Adventurer Like You says, As soon as OP mentioned something about how she had to think carefully about what she did because she was worried that the 17-year-old might get hurt as a result, ah, you can just tell that this is a kid who has been the grown-up with a moral compass in her family for a while now. Yeah, I like this kid. She's angry, but smart about it, and super brave. Rocky McNutt says, She kinda needs to talk to the therapist, though. I hope the father doesn't do something stupid. Marmoset or Marmoset replies, Yeah, for sure. She needs a change of mindset from thinking a therapist is something that she's being forced to do to make her parents more comfortable, to something that she does for herself to help her process this heavy crap that she's going through. Hopefully she gets there eventually. Delta Gardevoir says, She definitely needs therapy with what's going on in her life right now. But honestly, I don't blame her for being pissed off that no one wanted to tell her the truth about why the family was being split apart. It's not like she's six and wouldn't understand. She's 14 and absolutely will not accept life changes without explanation. She proved that she is not just a doll they can drag around with no feelings and opinions, and that pissed them off because they're assholes who think that she should just mindlessly accept that her life is permanently altered. What's funnier is that, if the dad had broken and told the truth to her, maybe his crime would have never been caught by her. So I'm actually glad they didn't tell her anything. Well, that's not exactly the update that I was expecting from all of this, but glad that OP has dealt with it in the best way possible by the sounds of it. I'm also going to jump on the bandwagon of saying that there is nothing wrong with going to the therapist, and at the same time I understand why OP would be hesitant about it. Perhaps it's something to look to in the future in order to deal with, you know, the resulting impacts of everything that's gone on. Food for thought. I'd love to know what you guys think about all of this in the comments down below. Our next post is by user hangingout28 titled... Am I the asshole for continuing to sleep nude despite my neighbors being able to see into my bedroom? So, I'm a 28-year-old dude and have been living in my house for a few years now. One of the main reasons I chose this place was because my bedroom faced east, allowing me to wake up to the morning sunlight. Most mornings I wake up before my alarm goes off, just because the sunlight coming through the window waking me up. There used to be a tree line that provided a natural barrier between my house and any potential neighbors, so I never saw the need for curtains or blinds, along with they're expensive as hell for the nice ones. Recently my neighborhood expanded, and most of the tree line my bedroom was facing was cut down to build new houses. So boom, then all of a sudden there's a house that was built right across from mine, and their window has a clear view into my bedroom. I've always been comfortable sleeping nude and it wasn't an issue when there was no neighbors around. But not long after the people moved in there, the father from the house came over to my house and pretty much told me to stop being nude in front of my window since his family can see inside my bedroom. He wasn't nice about it. But he wasn't mean either, just matter-of-factly. Like he gave me an order, and he fully expected it to be done like I was his kid or his employee. I was somewhat surprised, but I understood his concern so I made an effort to be more mindful of my nudity when I was in view of the window. I stopped cleaning and making my bed before getting dressed. I'd hop out of bed, walk into my closet, and at least put on shorts, and then go about my morning chores. That being said, I still sleep nude, and I occasionally end up being visible to the neighbors for a brief moment after waking up. 
The father came over again, leading to an argument between us. I told him I was trying my best to be considerate, but there's only so much I can do, and that it's my house, and I'm not changing my lifestyle because they moved in. He threatened to call the police and said that I was being a menace to the neighborhood, whatever that means. So am I the asshole for continuing to sleep nude, even though my neighbors can see into my bedroom? Honestly, I'm going to be on OP's side for this one. I think they're not the asshole because... Why are they looking out their windows so early in the morning? Have they not heard of a thing called blinds? OP is doing this within the privacy of their home. They have also adapted their morning routine in which they're not going to be seen naked by that family. I feel as though OP has been more than lenient with this family, and the fact that that father comes and has an issue, starts arguments, starts fights, that's just not on. I think the father of said family can invest in blinds and other solutions so that they're not looking directly into his bedroom, and I think he can mind his own business, not the asshole. In the comments, WildAd2495 says, Not the asshole. Some commenters are suggesting OP should invest in blinds. If the neighbors are bothered, then they should put up blinds. Why is this a problem for OP to solve? Pseudo Incognito replies, Not the asshole, but offering another simple solution. I got a bunch of that frosty rainbow window cling stuff, so it distorts what you're seeing from the outside and actually makes the sunlight extra pretty. Plus, you only really need to put it on the bottom part of the window to essentially blur out anything. I was thinking the same. I used to live in a rented apartment where all the windows faced the building across the street, and I wasn't comfortable with neighbors being able to look inside of my bedroom, so I asked the landlord if I could put frosted self-adhesive paper. This allows in the sunlight, but blurs everything. Landlord was more than happy with my suggestion. Asleep Hold says, No assholes here, but... Maybe you could get a window cling that obscures the view to your bedroom without sacrificing the natural light that you enjoy and fleshy freedom that you love. Jane Adams says, Everyone sucks here. While you have every right to be naked and do what you want in your own home, your neighbors, and particularly their children, also should not have to see you naked without their consent. Your neighbors could get blinds and curtains, but equally so could you. If the price is an issue, you could get one of those privacy films that attaches to the window with static. You can cut them to size. Could be a bit more expensive than some cheapy curtains, but will be cheaper than really nice blinds. I have some, and I love them. They let in sunlight without compromising my privacy. Posted by user Throw RA Manny, titled, Am I the asshole for going to my brother's bachelor party? I, male 28, have a girlfriend, female 22, Nalia, and we have been dating for close to a year at this point. We have a great relationship leading up to this point, and now I'm just in shock at the position that we're now in. Nalia and I recently found out that she was pregnant. It was shocking to say the least, because we weren't actively trying, because her and I were under the impression that she will never be able to naturally conceive children. She told me that when she was younger, she went through some horrible stuff, and as a result of that, the doctor told her that she will never probably be able to have a kid of her own without medical intervention. So, this was a somewhat of a miracle baby, and we were both fully prepared to have this baby, until she unfortunately miscarried. It was really horrible to say the least. She fell into a depression, and I was sad too. Two weeks later, I had a trip planned for my brother's bachelor party. This was planned way before we even found out that she was pregnant. She told me how she didn't want me to go and that she still needs me, but I wasn't sure what she wanted me to do if I stayed. I told her that I'll be back in three days and she seemed fine with that answer because she gave me the go ahead. The day I was leaving, she asked me, are you seriously actually going to go? And I told her that I had to since the ticket in her hotel is non-refundable so I did end up going. The whole trip I barely heard from her, and I tried calling her, and she just ignored me. I came home from the trip to our apartment, and all of her stuff was gone and she took my dog and dropped it over to my parents' house. I went to my mom's house and picked up my dog, and she told me that my girlfriend dropped the dog off because she couldn't watch it and she needed space from me. I told my mom what happened, and she told me that I was an idiot and an asshole for what I did. I don't believe that what I did was wrong by going on this trip, like she told me I could go. I tried calling her to sort this out because I love her, and I've just been ignored so far. So, am I the asshole? Edit, yes, sorry for the typo, I'm a male. I'm at work and she told me point blank that I could go. 
Second edit, I get it, my spelling sucks, I wrote this at work. Second, I'm not blaming my girlfriend for me going to Vegas. I'm just simply saying that she gave me an okay that I thought at the time she truly didn't care. Lastly, saying remarks regarding that her having a miscarriage was the best thing that could happen is extremely hurtful. You can say I'm an asshole without saying that. OP, sometimes your partner will tell you, it's okay, I'm fine, and you have to read between the lines and realize they're not fine. Sometimes communication is less than direct, and it's up to you to pick up on that and not just take it at face value. I think what you've done is wrong, and I think you've upset her while she was extremely vulnerable, and I think that yes, you're the asshole in this situation. Now in the comments, Freedom Soul Spirit says, quote, I told her I'll be back in three days, and she seemed fine with that answer because she gave me the go-ahead. Did she say something like, I'm fine if you go, or something like, fine, go then? Edit OP's response, she said, I don't care, just go. So I took it at face value. I'm not a mind reader. Well, that's definitely in the something like, fine, go then category, which means that she was tired of explaining why she needed you to stay, so she gave up. You don't have to be a mind reader to know that she didn't want you to go. She told you, you ignored her, and you told her that you were going. When you were leaving, she told you again, you ignored her again and went anyway. It's not surprising she left you. You're the asshole. This is weaponized incompetence 100%. I'm not a mind reader. He says like he doesn't understand that I don't care, just go. It's not the same thing as I'm fine with you going. Also, it's not like she didn't speak her mind. She literally asked him and told him she needs him and to please not leave her alone. Yeah. He knows she's depressed. Now, of course, she's not communicating perfectly, but I don't care, just go, is quite obviously her giving up, despite not being okay with it. I can't stand men like this who are always the ones complaining about how women just never say what they mean. Like, do they not, buddy? Or have they said it so many times and it keeps falling on deaf ears that they just give up? Yeah, most women say stuff quite clearly. We do tend to formulate things as a question at first, because we are socialized to not try to impose our opinion, but that's generally to open the discussion, and it's generally quite transparent. For example, is there a particular reason you put that there? No. Then could you put it in its intended storage in the hallway closet next time, please? That's not cryptic, that's just trying to be polite. In my mini scenario, of course the man can say yes, I don't know where it goes, Yes, I really needed to go to the bathroom and I forgot to put it away. Yes, I find this shelf much more convenient than a closet, etc, etc. Honestly, I think the whole stereotype of women never say what they mean was caused by men who didn't listen or who ignored their clearly stated wishes. Holy Gonzo says, You left to go on a fun trip shortly after your girlfriend had gone through a physically and emotionally traumatic experience? Where, in that sentence, do you feel like you did the right thing? You're the asshole. And now, on to the updates. I appreciate the feedback, even though very harsh, and I know I'm definitely in the wrong. I want to apologize to my girlfriend. I realized I effed up badly. She agreed to meet up with me later in talk. Final update, for anyone that still cares, thanks for all the judgments and advice, and me and Nylia had a deep discussion. She cried to me and apologized, and we are on good terms now, and we are still grieving. If you ask me, that kind of sounds like a lie and that that didn't happen, but hey, I hope reconciliation happened. I doubt very much that Nylia is the one that needed to apologize or did apologize. Anyway, in the comments, yikes. Sometimes you really have to wonder how some people just lack the ability to empathize with others. She miscarried a child she never thought she'd be able to have, and he supported her for all of 17 days before leaving to go to a party. Wow. Just wow. What the hell does OP mean, she apologized? It means that he needled and whined and manipulated her into agreeing that he's the victim here. My personal opinion, given his latest update, I 100% believe that he gaslighted or manipulated her in that conversation because Nylia had the right to be upset. I hope she runs into this post. Yep, I agree. And what the hell was she apologizing for? Our next post is by user Fluff Llama Pajama titled, 
Would I be the asshole for not having my cancer-stricken ex-husband stay with me through his treatment? For most of our marriage, my husband, 39 male, and I, 37 female, had a very happy relationship. We had good jobs, decent money, two kids, and loved each other. Then he got diagnosed with a rare form of cancer, and we went through years of painful treatments and recovery together. We moved to a small house to be close to the research center where he underwent treatment. His parents paid half of the down payment on the house, the other half was from our savings and investments. In the divorce, he gave me the house and took all of his medical debt. We've been divorced a year, but now his cancer has come back and he needs treatment again at the same research hospital. He wants to stay in what is now my house while undergoing treatment and his parents expect me to house him and look after him because he was generous in letting me have the house without taking his rightful share from the equity. When we were married and he was undergoing treatment, it was new stuff that was expensive and also very physically draining on him. We were lucky that both our jobs were supportive and flexible, but with his health issues, little kids, and expenses, we had to downgrade our lifestyle a lot. That, plus the physical changes in his body, made him very depressed. Whenever he felt a bit better, he'd go stay in his hometown. It's a small town where most of his family and a lot of his childhood friends live. I was doing all the caretaking of him, while also dealing with insurance complications. I was also managing the kids, the entire household, and my full-time job. We had help from friends and neighbors, but it was very hard. I wasn't happy about him spending his healthy days away from us, but it was good for his mental health, so I didn't feel like I could object. When he was staying there, he had reconnected with his high school girlfriend. A couple of years ago, he admitted to me that he was sleeping with her, and I filed for divorce. He had fully recovered from his cancer by then. There are other aspects around the cheating that left me very heartbroken and feeling betrayed. His giving me the house and taking all the debt was an apology of a sort. His parents feel that I owe him for getting the house and should let him stay there for the two to three months that his treatment is at the facility. I do want him to be well, and I don't want my kids to lose a loving father, but I can't deal with having him around me, especially not if I end up being his nurse and caretaker again. I am still very bitter about how our marriage ended. A lot of people close to me are telling me that I should support him for the sake of my kids. Would I be the asshole if I say that I can't do that? Honestly, with the cheating and the fact that he wasn't there for you a lot of the time, I don't blame you in your decision not to house him. You poured your heart and soul out for this man who was struggling, and he's turned back in your face and spat in it multiple times. Those are not the actions of someone that loves you, and the event of a cancer coming up again is not any reason for you to turn around and forgive him. I stand by your choice not to house him and not to have anything to do with him, not the arsehole OP. In the comments, no dragonfly 4661 says, Not the arsehole. Let his girlfriend take care of him. And OP replies, They announced their engagement the day the divorce was finalized. That still hurts so much. Oh, what the hell? I kinda hate this guy and I don't even know him. Agreed. It's hard to feel sorry for someone who is selfish, even though he's got cancer. A sick asshole is still an asshole. OP is definitely not the asshole. The side piece can carry the burden of caring for him. The in-laws can take a running jump. A sick asshole is still an asshole. This should be OP's response to anyone who asks. This says it all. He chose to spend his healthy days away from his kids too. He's not a good dad. So he left OP to handle all of his insurance issues instead of being with his kids or, I don't know, helping with his own insurance issues? Or helping with his wife or, I don't know, doing something romantic for her? I bet OP was exhausted. Because let's face it, there's always insurance issues. And this can turn into its own full-time job. On top of taking care of kids and a sick husband, I'm surprised OP's job survived this. I can only imagine how hard it was to raise kids, handle the insurance, and care for a sick husband. I wouldn't want to go through that again too, especially knowing that he was cheating, and this time he would be spending his healthy days away from you again with the side piece who he married. And announcing your engagement the day of your divorce is always an F you to the first spouse. You can't even wait a week after cheating the whole time? Jeez. Either the in-laws don't know the extent of cheating, or they don't care. He was staying with them while cheating with OP, so I wouldn't be jumping through hoops to please them. Just Browsing 086 says, Not the asshole. 
Even without the cheating and whatnot, caretaking is a full-time job and it's very taxing emotionally, mentally, and physically. You're not his wife anymore. You have no obligation to do this. And OP replies, the last time I did it out of love. I can just not do it now. It was very difficult. The big upside to me in getting divorced was not having to deal with that anymore. As difficult as it is to take care of a sick person, dealing with the insurance bureaucracy and keeping track of all the medical contacts and treatment details is a pretty big logistical nightmare. Texas Liz replies, Did he ever marry the girlfriend? Why isn't her infectious laugh curing things now? I'd ask his parents if they expect you to let him and his new wife live at your place. We divorced. There's a new woman who is supposed to be taking the nurse and a purse role that I happily relinquished. And OP replies, this made me laugh. Thank you. And now, on to the update. So the Sunday after I made the post to Am I the Asshole, my ex-in-laws picked up the kids for a zoo trip. They sometimes come to pick them up to entertain them, and so I thought nothing of it. A few hours later, a very teary and contrite mother-in-law dropped off two bawling kids with me. She told them their dad is sick and will die if he doesn't stay with us and go to the hospital. We hadn't had a talk with the kids yet about the diagnosis, and she dropped it on them that he is dying from cancer. He is not dying. It's a painful treatment, but he'll recover. I was so furious, I was raging. I called the ex and tore him a new one. He was shocked too, and we exploded together at his mum. She broke down and cried, begging me not to take away her grandkids from her, as if I'd trust her after this. X and I together talked to the kids, him on video, and assured them that yes, he is sick, but he'll be fine. He just needs to go to the hospital, and they'll make him better like the last time he was sick. The kids settled after that, but my oldest has been at me crying and begging to make dad come live with us. I promised them that I'd talk to dad and figure out what's the best thing to do. I swallowed a lot of bile to talk to him about why he was doing this. We had a pretty long and detailed discussion. The bottom line is that he's broke, still has a decent job, but his credit is ruined. He has a lot of debt and he stupidly got the cheapest insurance that barely covers anything. Fiance is no help either. She's worse off financially, so he needs a place to stay. He can't afford this otherwise. His parents are funding some of his medical payments and are already stretched. He was financially alright when we broke up, so I have no idea what happened in such a short time. Anyways, X and his girlfriend moved into my daughter's room. My daughter happily gave it up to her dad and is sharing her little brother's room. Both kids are over the moon happy to have their dad in their home. My daughter keeps checking on him every few minutes to make sure he's still okay. Mother-in-law traumatized my kid. I'll never forgive that woman for this. I let the girlfriend move in with him because I was too angry to care about who came to look after him as long as it wasn't me. I didn't know how I could bear having her in my home, but it appears to be more misery for her than me, and that strangely makes it more tolerable for me. She is teary-eyed and crying all the time. It's only been three days, but I am so annoyed that I want to shake her and tell her to pull it together. The current treatment plan is for three months. I'm counting down the days. I am thankful for the many people who gave me great advice on my last post. I wasn't expecting things to go this way, but they played me by manipulating my kids. I'll slowly pull myself and the kids away and move, but for now I've got to deal with this for my kids' sake. Added to add, I was trying to make this update more than a week ago. So to add to that, X's treatment is coming along nicely. The tumors that grew again are much smaller than before, and the new stuff that they are giving him is more directed too, so he's not having as many bad symptoms as he had last time. I had promised myself that I would do nothing to help, and I stayed away from both X and his fiance, but I did end up helping him deal with insurance. His fiance has the personality of a wet noodle and cries all the time. It was easier for me to do it than to deal with her struggling. X is polite enough to me, but his personality has changed. He's a different person and not very nice towards his fiance. I didn't expect to, but I feel sorry for her. In the comments, Glum Hamster says, This is definitely a case of the grass not being greener on the other side. Honestly, sell the house. Your ex will always need treatment and he will always ask to stay with you. You don't have to move cities or states, but move far away from that clinic. The house is legally yours. Take the money and buy something that fits your budget for you and the kids. Don't, do not give him any of that money. 
It's your house, your sale, your money. Him and the family need to figure out what to do without depending on you. And OP replies, I've started looking into selling and am researching places to move to. But it is so very difficult. I don't have the budget to put the house on the market while I live elsewhere, especially if it takes longer than two months to sell. I also don't feel secure opening the house for showings while my kids and I live here. The other issue is that I don't have close family that I can rely on, and here in this neighborhood, I had built up an awesome support system between neighbors and friends. Giving that up and starting somewhere new with two little kids in tow is daunting. I'm trying to evaluate which option is the bigger con. Jalenrix replies, Is an alternative sitting down with your husband and kids to explain that this is a one-time offer? After these three months are up, they need to start saving and planning for any future care. And OP replies, I talked to my ex about it before he moved here. He agreed never again. With my daughter though, I am going to wait to have that conversation when she's not so freaked out about her dad's mortality. Calm Assist 2676 says, I would never trust ex-mother-in-law with the kids, ever. Like, never again. And have a hard talk with the kids about manipulation, because that is exactly what she did. Weaponize the kids and their love for their dad to get what she wanted. OP replies, Yes, my blood still boils about that. I never talk bad about the ex to kids, but I talk to them about how what their grandmother did was wrong, and they understand that to some extent. Nofi161 says, I think you should feel vindicated because you came out on top of this situation. You were the most capable and most mature adult in that bunch. You're a saint for letting them stay, but don't give him a cent since you mentioned that he is broke. And OP replies, you know, in some ways I do feel better about things since they moved in. At the end of the day, my life is fine. I don't plan on giving him any money. I'm glad that it ended this way personally, and all the best to OP and the ex-husband in navigating this issue in the future. What do you guys think about this one? Let me know in the comments down below. Our next post is by user the Smart A55, titled, Am I the asshole for lying to a co-worker that a friend of mine is not single? So, I have a co-worker who has shown interest in a friend of mine and asked me if he is single. He is, but this girl is a party girl while my friend is less party-oriented. She's constantly talking about the dudes she's having fun with while at the same time lamenting that she can't get a guy to marry. She acknowledges that the guys she's having fun with are not marriage material. She's had some dates with guys that are apparently looking for a serious relationship, and she's a completely different person with them. She pretends to be a homegirl and straight up lies about having one night stands pretty frequently. So my friend group was out when we suddenly bumped into her and just said hi, did some small talk, and introduced her to my group of four, and then went on our separate ways. Later at work, she asked me about John, not real name, if he was single, and if I could hook them up. I told her that he wasn't single, and she started asking about their relationship, how long it's been, is it solid, etc. I told her that I don't have many details as we don't hang out that frequently, which is another lie, and then I deflect by telling her that I had to go. Now I'm worried that the lie is going to eventually blow up on me, but I feel that she's a horrible match for John. I have no doubt that she'd be able to weasel into his life if given the chance, as she's pretty attractive. So, am I the asshole for lying to my coworker about my friend? Personally, if you don't think that the relationship would be solid and they wouldn't be a good match for each other, I don't see you being an asshole for this white lie. I would think that you're doing right by them and saving them both upset in the future by just not allowing this to happen in the first place. So I'm saying not the asshole for this one. In the comments, Mink27000 says, Not the asshole in my opinion. You know your friend pretty well and know that this girl isn't going to be good for him in the long run. I think you're a good friend for doing that, but it would be good as well to tell him the truth if you think he can handle resisting her. The fact that she was trying to see if his relationship was solid gives me the icky feelings that she would test boundaries. Same, I get the feeling she hasn't experienced many rejections to her face. That part was what made my thinking immediately go to not the asshole. At the beginning I was thinking, well, sometimes opposites can be good for each other and have good relationships, but as I read, she just sounds like she can't find the type of man she's looking for because she isn't the type of woman they would go for. How is taking away your friend's agency by making the decision for him being a good friend? If you really wanted to be a good friend, you'd tell the truth and let the friend decide whether or not to reject the girl. 
Lying about the situation because you don't think your friend is smart enough to make a good decision for himself seems like a major asshole move to me. Seriously, I don't understand how the not the assholes are getting all the upvotes here and all the you're the assholes are getting downvotes. Tiny Palpitation replies, It's not a terrible idea to not want to co-mingle your social life with your work life. If she's that interested, she can seek him out on her own. If OP gets involved and things go sideways, he could find himself sitting in some HR meeting that I'm sure he'd rather not be a part of. Plus, if OP gives John a heads up about the little lie and why OP felt that it was necessary as well as the possible HR issues and lost friendship if they do date and things go bad, then at least John can decide for himself as to whether or not he wants to take a chance or keep the lie going. Not the asshole. It is self-preservation and I personally hate playing middleman. If you like someone, just ask them for yourself and leave me out of it. Posted by user CuriousCar1, titled, I, 28 male, kissed my daughter's friend's mum, 30 female, and I'm really happy about it. My daughter is 6, and she met her new BFF at the start of the school year. Her mum is a very nice lady. They don't live far either, so we have invited them over a lot. It's become a regular thing for the past two months to have them over every weekend, both Saturday and Sunday. Either we take the girls out somewhere fun, or we stay in watching movies and do other activities. I spend lots of time alone with her. We can talk for hours about anything, and the next thing we know time has flown by. Then the butterflies in my stomach, and the blushing every time she smiled, started hitting me. I've been a full-time single dad for three years, since my ex decided to walk out on our daughter, so dating has never been on my mind. They spent Christmas Eve and Christmas with us, which led to them staying all weekend. The girls fell asleep on the couch watching Encanto, and it was me and her up for another hour chatting. Had a little bit of wine in me, so of course I blurred out that she looks beautiful right now. Randomly, out of nowhere. In the end, we kissed though, so looks like it worked out for me. My heart was racing so fast. I'm pretty sure my whole face was red as hell, because it felt so warm suddenly. We were both smiling like total idiots. Before they left earlier, she kissed my cheek, and man, I just wanted to pull her in. It's my first kiss in years with someone I feel really connected to. It's just been a really great weekend. Very, very happy. In the comments, Kino says, Oh my goodness, how sweet. Reading things like this when I'm in a funk lifts my spirits. The beginning of a rom-com. I'm gonna save this post, so do us all a favor and give us updates. OP replies, I'll let you all know. Next part is trying to stop being a chicken and ask her out on a date. I wanted to before she left, but what can I say? My damn brain decided to take a little vacation. Grand Theft Bay replies, Why don't you set up a playdate slash sleepover for the girls, obviously, for New Year's Eve. You can ask her out on a date at midnight. A kiss on the cheek is definite interest from her. Best of luck, OP. And OP replies, I might ask her out before that, hopefully, but we are definitely spending New Year's together. Lol, yeah, exactly. Just for the girls. Why not do a more adult part of the night? Maybe after the girls fall asleep, you can have a little date in the kitchen, play some music, and enjoy a meal together. You could even suggest changing your outfits and doing yourselves up, and begin your date at 1 o'clock or something. Technical Push says, Thank you for sharing your beautiful story. It's the small moments like this in life that we always remember. I hope it all works out for you all. And OP replies, It's definitely a moment I keep replaying in my head right now. I'm hopeful for this. Like honestly, really hopeful. Thanks for reading it. All the support and excitement gets me excited all over again. And now on to the update. I can't believe I'm saying this, but I've got a girlfriend, guys. And let me tell you, as a single father who's usually way too busy to date, that is nothing short of a miracle. I asked her out and she gave me an enthusiastic yes. It was exciting. It was nerve-wracking. We had dinner the following night without the kids. Got to admit it did feel a little awkward. No kids there is a distraction and this was meant to be romantic. We eased into it though. Then we just didn't want the night to end. After dinner, we walked around her whole neighborhood just talking until it was really starting to get late. She looked so beautiful I couldn't stop looking at her. Then last night with the girls was... I can't even describe how happy it made me. We agreed not to tell them about us being together for a while and no PDA in front of them. 
So even if it was hard keeping our hands to ourselves, it still felt nice making dinner, watching movies with the kids, and making a comfy pillow fort. They swore they were going to stay awake to watch the ball drop. <laughs> Famous last words. They were out before 11, kids asleep. Then it was midnight, and we shared our first New Year's kiss. Best night I've had. We did end up getting carried away, but you know what? I don't care. It was amazing. We stayed up all night talking afterwards, chatting about everything. Life, where we want things to go. It's been a long time for sure since I had an intimate conversation like that with anyone. We sure as hell didn't regret staying awake all night when we woke up at 7am to the kids playing downstairs and asking for breakfast already. <laughs> been a chill day today. Can't stop smiling. For me, this is what it's all about. Happy New Year's everyone. I'm definitely looking forward to all the possibilities. In the comments, JansGuy68 says, Spent an hour on Am I the Asshole earlier today. This was a much, much needed palate cleanser. Well, why would you put yourself through that? Granted, Am I the Asshole and many other subs on Reddit can seem like a Nietzschean hellscape, but it's still preferable to working. How sweet. They should make a lovely blended family. The BFFs can become sisters. Reminds me of that sequel to the original Parent Trap. My wife and I ended up the same way. Both single parents, became good friends, our kids are BFFs, and then BAM. It's great. When you've got kids and your friends, you see each other in the thick of it, and under the best and worst circumstances, and it's real. Honestly, it's great to see such a positive post in the torrential hellstorm of everything else that's on here. Very happy for OP and their partner. Not jealous at all. <laughs> Could never be me. No. My neighbor, whose driveway is parallel to mine, placed wooden planters in my driveway, blocking me from exiting my car. What can I do? Quebec. So we have constant legal problems with this neighbor, and none of them are ever resolved because they're just minimal enough to not be worth talking to a barrister about. But I'm really annoyed with her being brassy enough to put wooden planters in my driveway. They have fallen, and the cars have been scratched. If I need to drive towards the back of my driveway, I cannot exit my car except through the trunk. And she didn't ask to put them there. They're on what is legally my property. Can I use them as a place to put my cigarette butts or something? There are no flowers in them, just dirt. Occasionally they fall over and block my driveway entirely. Can I put flowers in them? If I can't get rid of them, can I at least make them useful? Since they've been on my property for months now, can I just have them thrown out? If I ask her to get rid of them, she will scream at me and make a huge scene. I've had to tow multiple cars from our driveway that were her guests. She's placed random dumpsters in our driveway at 6am without telling us. I'm sick of letting her petty behavior slide, and at minimum, I just want the planters gone. I've tried moving them back onto her property line, and she's moved them back into my driveway. Edit, a comment disappeared asking if I have documented previous incidents. The answer is yes. However, in Canada, our documentation is limited as both parties need to consent to recordings. So our cameras only point at whoever is at our front door and the very end of our driveway. All of our neighbors were informed about the camera installation and reassured that we were not recording their property. She has moved the planters out of view of the cameras, I have the timestamp app, and am considering taking photos twice a day to prove that they have been abandoned on our property. I'm not sure if this would be worth my time though. The local authorities have other things to do than care about her planters on my property. I even recently called 911 to report a downed power line that posed a danger to anyone walking on the sidewalk. The dispatcher told me, I wish Hydro Quebec, city's power company, would stop telling people to call us. It's their problem. The cameras have captured other things such as her letting people park in our driveway, her verbally confronting me while I was standing on my porch by the front door because we towed her illegal worker in our driveway and her animals wandering onto our property. By illegal, I mean that permission from the city to do construction was not obtained. If anyone wants to make physical changes, slash do renovations or construction, you need a permit from the city which protects the workers from being paid unfairly and ensures that safety measures are being taken. She doesn't do that. We wanted to report this to the city, but we're afraid of retaliation. She already tried to kill my dog once prior to installing the cameras. In the comments, Outside Confusion 8 says, A good fence, a tall and solid one. 
You have the largest choice of colors and themes in price ranges. Also, a good sign on the fence. It can say pretty much whatever you like, but I'd say, no trespassing. Violators will be towed at vehicle owner's expense. Good luck, be safe. Additional attorney says, I'd have a log of dates, times, and what happened, recording or not. That's not small stuff. Almost killed your dog? At some point, that may come in useful. Verbally telling someone all infractions you've dealt with hits different than if you produce a 10-page document. I'm not a lawyer, so I'm curious to see what the rest of the advice amounts to. At a minimum, she's trespassing, and you could start reporting every single instance, and then there's a formal trail with the police. First, be certain it is your property. Have you had a survey done? If they are on your property, you can do with them as you please. She has no right placing things on your property. And OP replies, yes, a survey has been done. We have a line marking where her property ends and our property starts. We had to make this clear to her in the past when she wanted to repave her driveway and we didn't. So we have clashing pavement colors clearly indicating where her property stops. If you are correct, I assume you are, but just to be sure, I'm going to double check some local laws. I think the planters with no plants in them belong in the compost. Since they're made with untreated wood, they're a bit of an environmental hazard anyway. But now I need to look up if untreated wood can be put in the compost. And now, onto the update. My neighbor, or someone that lives in the household, must be on Reddit, because a few days after I made my post here, the planters were moved back onto her property. The next day, they were destroyed and put out for the garbage collectors to dispose of. It seems that all I had to do to solve this issue was post on this subreddit, Color me surprised, but also very pleased that I didn't have to lift a finger to deal with this matter. Seeing as she, or someone she lives with, seems to regularly be on Reddit, you might be seeing more posts from me about other legal issues that she has willingly created or ignored. I'm relieved. This is the easiest and best outcome that I could have wished for. No wasting my breath arguing with her, no need to bring out the pettiness, and she disposed of them herself. Thanks for the advice. Now, it's almost time to enjoy the weekend without climbing out of the trunk of my car. Edit. I've received heaps of messages saying two things. A. I need to burn this account, and B. Quebec is a one-party consent province for recording conversations. I'd like to touch on that if I may. I'm not worried about A because our neighborhood is for the most part made of amazing people to call neighbors. I don't foresee having any issues, especially when public security, think of them as a government-funded neighborhood watch with the authority to issue tickets for non-felony-esque things, is only minutes away. As for B, people DMing me saying that I only need one party to consent to a recording in Quebec are correct, if we're in public. In a private setting like my own property where there's an expectation of privacy, I can only film slash record what is mine. So if someone walks into the street and starts shouting and making a scene, that's one thing, because everyone else can hear, but if they're simply walking their dog past my house, or they're on an adjacent lot, I can't record them without permission because they have a reasonable expectation of privacy. The law is oddly specific, and we had to double check when installing the cameras. And now in the comments, Repok21 says, quote, she already tried to kill my dog once prior to installing the cameras. She... what? Yeah, burying the lead right there. Yikes. A bad neighbor can make living in even the perfect house a torturous experience. Yep, it's the most important part of finding a house to buy or rent. You can get used to a bad floor plan, but you can't get used to a bad neighbor. Posted by user SillyStruggle2528 titled... Am I the a-hole for not wanting to contact my son after he was the one who abandoned me? I, 45 female, have a son from my previous marriage. I got pregnant way too young at the age of 20 from my high school sweetheart, David, 45 male. We got married at the age of 22 after we graduated college. David was rich. He didn't want me to work, so I was just a housewife. My son was the apple of my eye. I gave everything to him. He was my world. He and I were really close, and I never had a doubt in my mind that I would not be alone in this world as long as I had him. That's until 10 years ago. I found out that my husband was cheating on me with a younger colleague of his. And what is worse, my 15-year-old son knew about it. He hid the affair from me. Imagine how broken I was. I was betrayed by the two people I cared most for in this world. I asked him why he did that. 
Why did he hurt me? His response was that his dad told him not to. He bought him gifts to keep his mouth shut, and having a young stepmom made him popular among kids. I was totally blindsided when I learned my husband took my little boy to meet that woman. They made excuses that they went on a ski trip and they took the mistress with them. I felt like a fool at that time. In the divorce ruling, my son chose my ex over me. I was heartbroken. My son didn't even want to visit me after it was all done. I even tried to reach out to him once he turned 18, but he just refused. At that point, I gave up and I just went on with my life. I would still get sad over the years wondering how he was doing. I did move on and I met someone who was a single father of two girls. I married him and a few days after our wedding, I got pregnant again. The pregnancy was a nightmare. I wanted to meet my son and tell him that he's going to be a brother to a baby girl. The labor was painful. I almost died on the spot after giving birth to my daughter. I still wanted to meet my son, but I knew he didn't want to see me, so I just gave up on the idea. Over the years, the memories of him just became vague as I immersed myself into my new family. A week ago, I got a series of messages from him on my Facebook. He said that he missed me a lot and wants to meet up with me. It took me by surprise. Over the last 10 years, he has not contacted me, but now he wants to see me? Why? I've been going over every possible reason. The worst part is that I do not feel excited about it. As a mother, I know I should be over the moon, but I'm not. My parents and husband know that. They've been pushing me to meet him. They say that I need closure, as after all, he is my son. But I don't know if I want to relive the same trauma. So, am I wrong? Honestly, I don't think you're wrong for being hesitant in this regard. There is every possibility that he comes into your life and hurts you again and leaves you with even deeper damage this time around. I feel personally that you are more than justified for not wanting to contact your son again after he abandoned you. That is more than understandable in this situation. So I'm going to say not the asshole. In the comments, Razmataz Certain says, You are not wrong for being hesitant. Opening yourself up to the possibility of being betrayed again has to be scary. You seem to be in a good place in your life now. Only you can decide the best course forward. The people who love you are pushing for this reunion because they'll likely think that a mother having their child in their life is always the best course. However, sometimes, regardless of blood relation, certain people are not good for you. It will be hard for others to understand because they didn't experience your heartbreak. There is no right or wrong decision. Do what is best for your mental health. You could even decide to pause on a decision and tell him that you need more time. I'm saddened that you experienced this level of pain. I wish you well. OP replies, I am inclining more towards not going, but I have yet to make a final decision. You could tell him that you'll reach out when you feel ready. That readiness may never come, but you need to put yourself first. The children you have now need to be the priority, and they need their mother to be in a good mental state. Actually, that would be a good way to see how sincere he is. If it is a genuine reach out, he will respect it. If not, then he'll most likely react poorly, and that will be your answer. This OP, you need time and tell him that. His response will likely tell you his motivation. I don't want to tell you what to do, but your ex-husband, his new wife, and your son sound cruel. I wouldn't be surprised if he has motivations outside of just wanting to reconnect to you. Don't offer money or trust this. If he missed you so much, he would have reached out before now. St. Francis 2968 says, I would hit the pause button until you feel ready. I agree. I am always a punching bag for other people's timelines. I often forget that I can create my own and not let them dictate the flow. He reached out when he was ready. OP, take time to do the same if that time ever comes. Also, OP should remember that her son is still that person who preferred money, young and beautiful stepmom, and popularity so much that he helped walk all over his own mother and shunned her. The fact that it took him 10 years to reach out is disturbing. OP's son may have realized that the stepmom wasn't a true mother to him or whatever, but he is still the same guy who saw his mother through his very shallow judgmental value system. And OP is 10 years older and won't be more glamorous or wealthy than she was when he last saw her and rejected her as inferior. And now onto the update. A lot of you have been requesting me for an update. I finally met my son after so many years. He was not a boy anymore. He was a man. 
He looked taller than I remember. So anyways, I'll give an update. I read your comments. Some of you gave me some good suggestions. I prepared myself for any possible outcome. He could be there to meet me and tell me about his life or maybe reconcile, or maybe he wants something. Regardless of what it is, I am keeping my guards up. I asked him to meet me in a public park. I asked my husband to be somewhere near so he could see me. My son came five minutes after I arrived. He was all grown up. I won't lie, I wanted to cry at that spot, but I held my composure. He said hi to me and I smiled. I commented that he has grown up and looks really nice. He just nodded. We sat down and it was silent. I was expecting him to say something at first, but I finally asked what he was up to these days. He told me he's doing fine, he just finished college and is going to apply for grad school. I said, that's great. And then it was an awkward silence again. He broke the silence and said, you must be wondering why I contacted you. I replied, for 10 years you haven't tried to contact me, but why now? I cannot help but wonder why you were trying to contact me when you told me years ago you don't want me near you because I embarrass you. His face got serious and he said, I know that, but I need something from you. A lot of you suggested that he must be here to ask me for money. Well, you guys were right. He asked me for money and the amount was 20k. He said he needed the money because he wants to go to law school and his father can't afford it because he lost a lot of money a few years ago due to a loss on his business and his company was bankrupt. He also had three more kids with his mistress wife. That's why they do not have money for him to go to grad school. It just sank my heart. After 10 years I was finally meeting him, I was hoping that we could reconcile and he would understand what I had been through or maybe my husband was lying to him, but no, he just wants money from me. I told him I cannot give him money, not such a huge amount. He got defensive and kept saying, why not? And then he asked, is this about dad's affair? Jeez, when will you get over it? I asked him, why do you hate me? What have I done to deserve your hatred? Have I ever raised my voice? Have I ever hit you or said no to you? Then why? You always pushed me away when I tried to get closer to you. Why and what did I do to deserve it? He took a deep breath and said, You don't understand, Mum. You really expected me to come with you? You had nothing. At least my dad could afford the lifestyle I wanted, and my friends actually liked Carla, his stepmom. Everything was fine until you discovered his affair and my deal with dad. I get it. You didn't hit me or scold me, but you were not able to afford the life I wanted. I asked him if he really thinks his father's affair was actually the best way for any of us. I sacrificed a lot for him, and yet he chose someone who he only met when he was 14. He said he doesn't want to talk about that because it was so many years ago and I should just drop it. I asked him why didn't he ever try to visit me. I even asked if it was his dad who tried to stop him, or any other reason, or is it something that I did? I tried to reach out to him multiple times, but he never answered or tried to be there. I gave him space because I thought that he was coping with a divorce too. He yelled at me that I was really annoying. His dad did not stop him. It was he who didn't want to meet me because I lived in a small apartment with only two bedrooms. He hated living in a place like that, and he ignored me on his 18th birthday because the gift that I had for him was pretty cheap and stale compared to what his dad and other people gave him. I agree. My gift was a box of his favorite cookies and an old vintage watch. I was struggling a lot at that time, so I couldn't afford to buy him expensive stuff, but does that mean that he should have ignored me like that? I had enough of it. I told him strictly that I will not be giving him money. I have spent years wondering where he is and how he is doing. He is still very disrespectful towards me. Throughout our whole conversation, he didn't even ask how I was. He just went straight to money. I was here hoping that we could move on. He had no idea how much of a mess I was when I learned the man I loved so much would betray me and then my own son would lie to me for him. I thought we had a special bond. My head has been going through a lot of conclusions. Maybe his dad was lying to him about me. Maybe he was mad about something I did, but now I have the full picture. I do not want to be his ATM. I wanted to be his mother even when he rejected me. I'm tired of feeling rejected and getting mistreated and taken for granted. He kept saying and getting even more defensive that I cannot do this to him. I am ruining his life. I told him no, I cannot trust him to give him so much money. 
He told me to cut the BS because he knew that I have the money now and I can easily give him some. I told him no again and again. He at one point stood up and blamed me and screamed that I am ruining his life and that I owe it to him. I called my husband and he rushed towards me to keep my son away from me. I know now that I should have trusted my instincts. I cried a lot when I came home. I lost him forever. I know a lot of you will call me a bad mother, you will call me a narcissist, but I am sorry. I have spent a lot of time in therapy to get over the pain of losing my husband and son. I cannot have him in my life only to be used as an ATM. Even if I gave him the money, there is no guarantee that after getting the money he will not ghost me or push me away, and then when the money runs out, he will come back to me again to ask for more. I cannot go through the similar pain. I may be able to forgive him for what he said to me, but I don't think I will ever forget what he said. He hated me because I had no money. I would have been fine with weekly visits from him, but he never even wanted that. Additionally, I discovered during our conversation that he was the one to find out that my husband was having an affair, and he asked his dad to buy him a new phone in exchange for not telling me. I lost. That's all I have as an update. I'm sorry if there were any mistakes. It's hard to write and form sentences and put all of it in a few words. And no, his birthday was not the only time that I reached out like many of you assumed. I tried to reach out to him before that many times. He said he didn't want to or had other excuses. I respected his decision and didn't bother him much. I finally gave up trying when he was 18, but I still checked his social media for quite a while until I gave up that too. Edit, thank you all so much for all the support. I am by no means a perfect mum, but I try my best. Also, as much as I'm hurt by his actions, that day, I still hope that he learns some adult responsibilities and becomes a more mature person. With that being said, I hardly think that I have the energy to consider reconciling in the future, even if he comes and says sorry. It was already too much for me to be there yesterday just to be humiliated again. In the comments, OKSDSDD okay, says, Your son is deranged and heartless, he's cold, callous, egotistical, entitled, seems to be devoid of empathy, and feels no remorse. OP, your son sounds like a sociopath. Stay away from him. Sounds like he'll make a good lawyer, just needs to work on his approach. Wow, my mouth is actually open reading your post. Unbelievable that he had the nerve to say that, and mean it that he didn't want to see you because you didn't have any money. He actually expected that you would just give it to him because he believes that you have it now? He wasn't even gracious or humble and has such an entitled attitude. How you are ruining his life? The dad who gave him everything isn't now? You did nothing wrong and this is not your fault. It doesn't matter whether you have the money or not, that is not the point. You were absolutely right to not give him a dime. You see now what this young man is made of and it isn't pretty. I do think you are exactly right. He had no interest in you as his mother and would have dropped you again. I am telling you, I did not expect this and his attitude and the way that he talked to you is quite shocking. He showed no interest in his half-siblings or anything about your life. I don't see anything you could have done differently. You took the risk to see what he wanted and it's a damn shame that he's turned out the way that he has. I'm glad that you have your husband and your family and unfortunately, now close the book on this part. Lean on your hubby and move forward with your life and know that you did all you can do and now you know. All the best to you. You are not a bad mother and you have nothing to be sorry about. OP replies, It was not that he was asking for money after so many years, but it's just I don't know if he will use that money for something bad like drugs or gambling. Also, I have no way to confirm if he's telling the truth about grad school or not, so it seems too risky to give such a huge sum like that. Your son made his bed and now he has to lie in it. He sounds like he made some mistakes in his life and now karma is starting to bite him in the butt. If he's upset, his stepmom or your ex can bail him out. Block him and move on. You deserve better. Even if he comes to you with a law school acceptance letter and a bill for 20k from the law school, even if you can call a number at the law school to confirm where the 20k will go, do not give him any money. You may have memories of a sweet little boy long ago, but I'm sorry, that little boy grew into a rude, selfish, greedy person who does not seem at all interested in building a loving relationship with you. This must be incredibly hurtful to accept, but I think you know that it's true. 
And yeah, honestly, I think the apple didn't fall far from the tree in this instance. It is disgusting the way that this boy has treated his mother. But that's just life sometimes, and sometimes people just aren't good. They're just not good people. And I don't think that good lawyers want bad lawyers like that entering their profession either. Anyway, I want to turn this on you guys. What did you think about this story? Let me know in the comments down below. Our next post is by user Anxious in the Lab, titled, My supervisor made a complaint about me to my scholarship institution. So I've started my doctoral project in October. For two months, I've learned the methods that I could use during my project. Then I proceed to do my own experiments mid-November. The thing is, I need to wait for more samples from my supervisor. Meanwhile, I go to lab, do some things, and then leave. In the lab, the supervisor and the technician told the students that we are responsible for our own schedule and we should come whenever we wanted during the day. I've been going to the lab around the afternoons and I assumed that this wasn't a problem till I got an email from a person in the uni who's responsible for the scholarship holders of an institution. The email said that my supervisor wasn't satisfied with my cooperation and asked me to explain why I don't go to lab even though it's necessary for my doctoral project and my scholarship is connected to this cooperation. The problem is my supervisor never mentioned this to me before. I had no idea that she wasn't satisfied with my work. Her going directly to my scholarship institution made me very upset because I am an international student and my income is just my scholarship and without that, I would have to go back to my country. I feel like she should have given me a warning first. Look, you have to come every day between these hours. I sent the person that sent me the email and also my supervisor an email explaining that it has been a misunderstanding. I thought lab hours were flexible and I didn't know there were strict hours. It's never been clarified to me before. I was always there when I needed to work with a technician or something or had a meeting. Sometimes I ask questions to my supervisor like, if it's okay to do this experiment. She's like, you don't have to ask me, you have to do your own plan. And sometimes she says, no, don't start yet. She is not very clear about what she wants from me. I just want to get done with my project and leave the lab for good to be honest. Is there anything I should do? This has been my first time in academia, so I'm kind of lost about what to do. I just don't want to get on her bad side so early on in my project, even though it was a misunderstanding. I also don't want her to have a bad impression that I don't come to the lab, etc. This just caused extreme amounts of anxiety and overthinking that I damaged the relationship between us. Also from my side, complaining about me to the institution that gives me money, basically my financial security, is not nice at all. In the comments, Rusty Finner says, I think you were right to be upset with how they went about it. Keep in mind a lot of academics are weird and awkward and struggle to communicate directly and have direct conversations. But ask yourself this, would they complain about the hours you were there if you were making good progress? Sounds like they are hinting that they are unhappy with your progress. For now, I would start making sure you were there 9 to 5 Monday to Friday and then start figuring out how you can improve your progress. It sounds like they are hands off as an advisor, so consider taking more responsibility for the direction of your project. Start by making a detailed plan of what you think needs to be done, don't wait for people to tell you explicitly what to do. When I was getting my PhD, I had a great advisor who let us work flexible hours. After returning from COVID, quite a few members of the lab were struggling to make any progress and just were not around during working hours ever. After many conversations and meetings, my advisor's last resort was making the whole lab be there 9 to 5. People complained, but hey, Grad school is a job, and that is what a job expects. Sounds like it could be a similar situation here. Eternally in School says, It's interesting to me how often I read stories like this and wonder if this is my PhD advisor. The fact that these stories are so similar suggests that there are professors out there with a similar lack of management skills and inability to have direct communication with their people. In my opinion, what you've shared here are the signs of toxic and poor leadership. I wouldn't worry about what they think of you, I'd say be more worried about what the hell awaits you if you stay in this lab. My advice is to get your agreed tasks completed and get out of that lab ASAP. Even if it's a great project and the PI has funding, it's not going to be worth the torture they will put you through. Trust me on this. Good luck, OP. And now onto the update. I should have listened to you guys. I should have left the moment I posted this on Reddit because things did not get better. 
In fact, they got worse, but now they are so much better. I worked my ass off through Christmas till the end of February, but my experiments did not give satisfying results according to my supervisor. We never had a discussion about my results until February. She sends me an email about a meeting for my work performance. This was the first meeting request in four to five months. I go there the next day. She tells me you don't fit the lab. You should have been an expert by now. Please look for another lab and tell your scholarship institution that you want to change your lab. She was rarely in the lab, one day per week for an hour, and all she heard about me and my progression was from our technician. The fact that she told me you lived in insert a bit undeveloped country name here and I lived in insert first world country here, maybe that is why we have so many different expectations, was so weird and irrelevant. That was not the first discriminating thing that she said. She also went on with, if I can't publish what you do, the university stops giving me money, then you would end up wasting things in the lab for nothing. Even though in my doctoral agreement, my thesis was supposed to be a monograph. There was also another option for a publication thesis, which you have to publish to get the title, and she never told me it was a must. I was caught off guard because I started to think, what if I can't find another lab? What if they cut my scholarship? I went home, cried like a baby for a few days, then started to look for another lab, and I found such a great supervisor with a project that fits me. It's been almost one and a half months in my lab, and I could not be happier. Also, apparently my technician and my old PI were gossiping about me and the students to the other labs. I even wrote three pages of a complaint letter to my scholarship institution if something goes wrong. It was such a mentally draining period of my life, working in that lab. Now I realize it all. Every morning I woke up with anxiety and a tight feeling in my chest. It was horrible. P.S. One month after me leaving, some other students texted me because he quit as well. Yesterday, I had another student texting me, hey, how did you find your new lab? As she was thinking of leaving too. I guess this speaks for itself. My honest advice to people who are thinking of leaving for reasons such as toxic environments, absent PIs, please do it. There are so many other good labs that will want to hire you. I did not believe that, but here I am now. I know everyone's circumstances are different, but please don't feel stuck. And thank you for everyone's kind advice from my old post, even though I did not listen at that time. In the comments, PHLFC says, Just because someone isn't fluent in your language doesn't make them an idiot. They might communicate brilliantly in their native tongue. Language barriers are solvable, and you can do some great work with someone once you find a way to communicate effectively. The old supervisor didn't care enough to try to solve that problem. Believing that the problem can't be solved is a big sign of bigotry. Penny Arena says, One of my co-workers is fluent in English, but has an accent. You should have seen the look on a client's face when I told him, Well, actually, co-worker has more education and credentials in our line of work. She's the one that I go to for help. What makes you think that I'm more knowledgeable? I'm sure he wore away all of his tire tread due to backpedaling. Hakili808 says, There were a lot of red flags that could have been escalated in a timely fashion. When someone is deliberately sabotaging you and it's affecting your academic career, you can't just play defense or stay quiet and hope for the best. Respond to those shitty emails with, Can you please clarify? Does this mean you will not set or clarify expectations because I am an international student? and start CCing above them. There is no working relationship to save. You have to make them treat you better out of self-preservation rather than their own sense of decency. Unexposed is by user Sierra Mollipop titled Am I the a-hole for saying, wow, I don't like you, to my friend's boyfriend? This happened some weeks ago, and I probably am the asshole, so I came here to check. I was at the mall with my best friend when another friend let's call her S, noticed us and invited us over. S was with her boyfriend at the time and wanted to introduce us, and since we enjoy meeting new people, we obliged. It did not take long before we realized that the boyfriend was, let's say, strange. He refused to talk to us, giving one-word responses to everything, and when the topic went towards things that we enjoyed or liked, he'd just go, I don't care. It was disheartening, to say the least. I try my best, generally, to include everyone in a conversation, but he, honest to God, refused to participate, even when the topic was his interests or his relationship with S. The thing that really broke the camel's back, for me at least, was that he made S talk for him and not in a, 
I don't know what to say, so please take the reins way, but in an almost they're beneath me way. S tried her best to accommodate, but there were things that she couldn't respond to, like what was the boyfriend's favorite video game and stuff like that. After around 30 minutes of trying to either ignore boyfriend and discuss other things or let him speak only for him to refuse to, I just didn't care anymore and went, wow, I don't like you. And he once again just ignored everyone. Even S when she tried to defend him by saying that I, I wish I was joking here, I still don't understand the correlation, that he is a feminist. The whole thing ended up just being awkward, and afterwards S didn't talk to me as much. It all came to a head at my best friend's birthday when S tried to confront me and said that I was a cow and was being mean to her boyfriend. I was most likely rude, I agree, though I genuinely was out of things to say at that point. So, am I the asshole? Edit, I spoke to S and friend and from what we know, me, S and my friend, the boyfriend isn't autistic. Me, S and friend are diagnosed with ASD, on the other hand, but if the boyfriend is, he isn't diagnosed or doesn't know it. Also, we're all adults, since people asked. I think the only thing you can potentially be an asshole for is being so blunt, but you're just giving back what he was giving you, so... Yes, an eye for an eye makes the world blind, but this guy deserved that, I think. I don't think this guy deserved the interaction or any response after a while. It would have been more productive for everyone to just forget that he was there, in all honesty, but I get that on first meeting someone that's rude. Anyway, I judge you not the asshole for what you've done. In the comments, hardcandy8923 says, Not the asshole. Sometimes people don't like each other. At least you were honest. I'd give him a pass for social anxiety or something akin to that, but I don't care is a horrific response to someone trying to befriend you. Temperature Dizzy 3257 says, I don't think social anxiety is an excuse. I have social anxiety and so does my husband. I was diagnosed when I was 8 years old. Yes, I'm uncomfortable in social situations and sometimes I'm nervous to speak, but I've never been downright rude and told people I don't care about what they're talking about. Not the asshole, OP. And I hope that someday your friend sees that her boyfriend's behavior is very rude. Right? Acting like this would trigger my anxiety way more than just trying to participate in a conversation. Not the asshole. Sometimes you just have to call a spade an effing spade. S is just blind because she likes him, God knows why. You were more objective. You tried to be nice and engage him into conversation, but he acted like a giant D-bag. Might as well say the truth than being forced to spend time with him again. I wish it was more normalized to do what OP did, to be honest. The civilized thing to do is ignore that kind of behavior, but that just enables those kinds of people and even makes for more of them. They're an honest-to-God thorn in the side of society and entitled people do huge damage. What if this guy had grown up being taught that he can't go through life being an ass? What if he developed more healthy coping strategies? The world would be a better place. I admire OP for not sitting on the fence. Honestly, I agree with this take. I think we should normalize just calling out assholes when they are being assholes. None of that brutally honest crap that's cringe and that's just stupid. Find a fine line between the two, but also at the same time, don't be a fence sitter. Anyway, I'd love to know what you guys think of this one. Is there any universe in which they are the asshole for calling out this behavior? Let me know.